Welcome everybody to tonight's city council meeting. Uh, we will start with uh, a motion to leave the non-public and seal the minutes of the non-public. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, now a, uh, Val, would you mind doing the roll call vote? Sure. Oh, we're doing a roll call on Oh, now, sorry. Oh, the sorry. Attendance? No, the attendance. Okay. The attendance. Okay. Mayor McEachern? Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Here. Councilor Tabor? Here. Councilor Denton? Here. Councilor Morrow? Here. Councilor Bagley? Here. Councilor Lombardi? Here. Councilor Blaylock? Here. And Councilor Cook? Here. All present, Your Honor. Uh, thank you, Valerie. Um, we do not have uh, our uh, city clerk, uh, Kelly Barnaby, uh, tonight. Um, we send our thoughts and prayers. Uh, we just ask for a moment of silence for uh, the loss of her brother um, that happened uh, a little over a week ago. Um, we're thinking of you, Kel. You'd please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There are no minutes to accept um, and no volunteer and committee reports. Uh, so next up is public comment. Um, Portsmouth residents go first. If you're on Zoom, um, could you please raise your hand now so I can see you? All right. So first up is um, uh, Ross uh, Lorenza on the topic of outdoor dining. Did I get that last name correct? You did. All right. And just if you would mind just uh, stating your name and, and city of residence for the, uh, for the record. It's, uh, Ross Lorenza, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Thank you for having me. Uh, I've been a Portsmouth resident since late 2020, uh, and outdoor dining has been a critical part of my experience uh, in the city, whether it is down by the water or up towards Market Square, having the ability to take in the offerings of the local restaurants without having to go in to a darkened establishment I think um, has been beneficial to me um, and is beneficial to other residents and visitors to the city uh, especially those residents with animals I know a number of the restaurants and um, other establishments in town have allowed more pet friendly offerings since the addition of outdoor dining uh, and I hope that, that outdoor dining experience can be extended into the future um, for all future residents and tourists alike. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ross. Next up, Kevin Dwyer, again on the topic of outdoor dining. Hi, my name is Kevin Dwyer. I'm a Portsmouth resident as well at 461 Middle Street. Uh, I also own Dwyer's Pub at 96 Bridge Street in Portsmouth. Um, I'm a lifelong <coughs> resident and fan of Portsmouth. Uh, I would just like to ask the council to consider keeping the outdoor dining program and keep it at the same rates as last year or even include a cap to the pricing. Uh, just in my personal experience, if I included the entirety of my patio, I would pay $6,000 at the $5 per square foot rate. If the rate was brought to the suggested $10, my rate would increase to $12,000. Please consider the dramatic incremental increase every dollar and every square foot adds. Um, also, please consider how to make this program realistic for business owners of all different backgrounds. Uh, I realize in the case of patios and parking spaces, the city loses immediate revenue. But I would have to think that the revenue generated in others, is generated in other spots or their garages. Uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, parking revenue has increased in the past couple of years despite outdoor dining. And lastly, I, I love this town. I'm part of a large group of us who would like to keep making it an interesting place to live and visit in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, next up, Peter Musi.
Hi, folks. My name is Peter, uh, Peter Massey. I've Massey. lived in Portsmouth my whole life. I live at 160 Court Street. And uh, I'm just here speaking on behalf of outdoor dining for everybody in the city. Um, lived and worked in Portsmouth my whole life. And I think, you know, it's a great opportunity to have, keep it interesting and keep folks outside. And, you know, I've been the chef at Dwyer's Pub for about two years now. And I noticed a dramatic increase in business in the summer. And it really, it, I get more hours. It affects my pay, which really enables me to still live in the city that I grew up in, come to love. Um, you know, a lot of great places out there doing the outdoor dining. We got, you know, Dwyer's, The Goat, Massimo's, just the aesthetic really, I think, pulls people in and, you know, really, it's good for tourists and residents alike, I believe. Um, it's really all. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so, Al, you're next on the list, be from Hampton, so we'll come back to you after um, Portsmouth residents. Um, okay. Uh, Sean O'Doherty, Outdoor Dining. Hello, my name is Sean O'Doherty. I reside at 96 Bridge Street in Portsmouth, Department 1. I would like to speak in support of keeping outdoor dining and access to all restaurants of Portsmouth. When we think of going out to eat, we typically think of indoor dining. As a community with enough support, we can brighten our sidewalks, boost revenue for small businesses, while still keeping Portsmouth vibrant and walkable. Not only does outdoor dining access help restaurants, but it encourages residents to get out of the house, support small businesses, and appreciate this beautiful city from waterfront views to a hidden sidewalk patio they never could have discovered before. Boosted revenue from outdoor dining can help ground these restaurants for the slower portion of the winter months. This opportunity has potential to benefit the city as well with ideas such as a hit the patios compared to hit the decks to kick off the start of a patio season, and even such an idea of portions being donated back to the city somehow. Portsmouth prides itself on being walkable, vibrant, and easily accessible. We're shutting down small portions of streets and sidewalks, and <clears throat> as a city, we can show off different parts of Portsmouth we wouldn't be attracted to. With this flexibility of regulations, we can create a stronger community and help keep, th keep this beautiful city thriving. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, next, what's, oh, Sean. <laughs> Sorry, you've realized now I just read off of a list here. Sorry, Sean. <laughs> next up, David. Hansen on the topic of outdoor dining. Hi there. My name is uh, David Hansen, Portsmouth resident. Uh, I'm also the general manager of Flapper Company on Congress Street. Uh, I've lived in uh, Portsmouth my whole life and worked at Flapper as my first job as a busser at age 14. Uh, just growing up in the service industry, having this outdoor dining be a new thing has opened up so many doors for so many residents. Um, seeing this new addition, uh, the past few years, I've been a big supporter of the continuation in the city. Uh, the outdoor dining has become a great feature of Portsmouth for both, both locals and tourists alike. It has also added to the amount of guests able to dine in at a, re at a restaurant, giving more revenue to the business and the local economy as well. Uh, please consider granting local restaurants the ability to uh, open again for outdoor dining at an affordable cost. The people of Portsmouth will be outside supporting our local service industry workers year-round with your green light to continue outdoor dining. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thanks, Dave. Uh, next up, Paige Trace, and as always, the topic of Portsmouth. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Paige Trace, 27 Hancock Street. Outdoor dining, now it's going to be all year round. Um, and we're going to have one street that is now going to effectively be looked at as being two ways with a rule being made this evening without any public hearing, any plan about the finances or any announcement to the city of Portsmouth. Please, that is not transparent. It seriously, it's not. So I ask you all, please think, rethink. Uh, we all love outdoor dining. Nobody's saying anything against outdoor dining. But a restaurant that makes its business plan off of land that it doesn't own should rethink its business plan because it's at the expense of others. And that's all I have to say. I wish you all the best of luck. Please do outdoor dining, and yes, you can try it all year long if, if you want to. I don't think I'll be out there tonight having dinner. Um, thank you very much. 
Thank you, Paige. Next up, Liza Hewitt on the topic of equity. Liza Hewitt, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. In the past couple of years, outdoor dining was about keeping restaurants open and allowing people to eat outside during COVID. Everyone was supportive of that under the circumstances. In 2023, keeping outdoor dining should be equitable for all. The definition of equitable, fair, and impartial. Councillors Cook and Bagley have presented you with a plan that is neither fair nor impartial to all of Portsmouth. This outdoor dining plan, as it is written, is not equitable for all businesses in Portsmouth. It selects a few <coughs> restaurants in downtown and provides them with subsidized space for outdoor dining. In order for a city to be vibrant, it needs not only restaurants, but also small businesses. Downtown stores have complained about outdoor dining and its impact on their businesses. In order for outdoor dining to be equitable, all businesses downtown should be allowed to have subsidized space on the sidewalk or parking spots in front of their business. In order for outdoor dining to be fair to abutters living in close proximity to outdoor dining locations, they should be notified and able to voice their concerns if they arise. Councillors Cook and Bagley have appeared to remove that option from their plan, explaining that they don't want residents to complain about outdoor dining. Councillor Denton would like to raise the reduction in fees for those outdoor dining restaurants who compost. Where is the equity for all restaurants in Portsmouth to be able to have composting subsidized by the city? As for restaurants locating their outdoor dining in the flow of traffic, I'm not opposed to not allowing this, as I think it, is very, it was very dangerous this summer. However, this plan does not allow streets to be closed for dining with one exception. If the street gets an average of less than a thousand cars per day. Apparently the councillors like to frequent a certain restaurant near Hill Street and would like the closure of that street to remain in effect. I should mention that the restaurant in question has two parking spots in front of their establishment that could be used for dining. How is closing roads for certain restaurants but not for others impartial? You've heard of spot zoning? Well this is spot dining. And now for the residents and taxpayers of Portsmouth. City Hall staff have said that they feel that a fee of $3,000 per parking spot and $10 per square foot for other areas is equitable. The councillors have instead ignored the staff and want to, change 15, to charge $1,500 per spot or $5 per square foot. Councillor, the councillors, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Bagley and Councillor Cook are not listening. Mr. Bagley threw what equates to a temper tantrum at the last council meeting because he felt that the previous council did not listen to city staff concerning the McIntyre and yet here he is not listening to the recommendation of city staff as it relates to outdoor dining. Before you vote on outdoor dining, you need to do some work on how to make it equitable for all. Perhaps a public hearing on such an important topic as outdoor dining would be a good place to start. Thank you. Thank you, Liza. You're welcome. Next up is Esther Kennedy on the topic of process. Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. And um, I agree with everything Liza just said. I uh, was a little worried when I watched the fees committee that there was no vote taken. So when you sent it to the committee, there nothing came back in my mind because there was no vote or no motion even taken at the fees committee. So that was the one place we had public comment, public outcome, so that we could comment on whatever they were going to bring back. Right now we have a situation where we have something buried in a packet. Um, and I do not believe a butters know that this is going on tonight. We have a snowstorm and we have a bunch of small businesses that will not be able to take advantage of outdoor dining. And I've been here numerous times and have said, I worry about those independent businesses that do not have parking out front because they're not a restaurant because you've taken it away for restaurants. Where is the equity in this process for all Portsmouth businesses? Where does it stand? I really commend Councilor Moreau because the last meeting she suggested that we let abutters know. 
And I would encourage you to do that. Right, the way I look at it is you buried it tonight. Mr. Bagley invited some of his friends and I appreciate it. It's nice to see other people here speaking. And all of a sudden, no one has alerted the people that are gonna be really affected, those people that are gonna lose parking in front of their small businesses. So I ask you, what have you done to make sure their voice is heard? I'd like to hear it. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Next up, uh, Peter Huda, also on the topic of process. Peter Huda, 280 South Street. Good evening, Mayor, Councilors. I'm here to speak in favor of outdoor dining. Um, I'm here to also question the process um, that occurred in the last council and through the fees committee, and it's, that's happening actually tonight. Last council meeting, the mayor requested the outdoor dining fees and the whole uh, proposal go back to the fees committee for a recommendation. I attended the fees committee meeting. There was no vote on a recommendation. There was nothing that the public could see, and yet tonight, a rule or a new policy is in the packet. Is this process? Next thing I'd like to call to your attention, there was a timely article yesterday in the Portsmouth Herald. And what caught my eye was, um, this was from the uh, Commissioner of Revenue for the state of New Hampshire. And there was a whole bunch of um, graphs in here. And underneath the graph, it said, Restaurants and overnight rentals have recovered since the pandemic, back to almost 2019 levels. In the proposal that's coming forward here, the, the, the lengthy discussion that, was, that occurred in the fees committee, and which is the same one that's in the packet tonight, um, is discounting again. Now, the problem with that isn't that we don't want outdoor dining. The problem is you went to the city manager last year and asked for advice and documentation. You went again this year and both times you discounted back to the same amount. And this year you're even cutting less and Councillor Denton is even adding another discount. Now I would ask you, is this fair to all of the restaurants downtown? Is this fair to all of the retail, all of the lawyers, all of the accountants, all of the hairdressers and everybody else downtown. I asked Councillor Denton after the meeting to take a look at what we are actually doing here. So tonight I ask you, I support outdoor dining, but I think this is an individual business decision. The amounts that are on here are not out of, out of control and the businesses have recovered. It's a total business decision on each one of their parts if they would like to participate. The residents should not be picking up the tab for our own public sidewalks again. I ask you to think about this and please look at the, your policies and your rules and I ask you to follow those. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Next up, uh, Mark Brighton on gutter dining do. Mark Brighton, Portsmouth. Uh, the last time I pointed out that three of you have a problem, uh, starting with Councilor Denton, you've had business dealings with Fox, so you should recuse yourself. Heck, you were even acting as though you were in your right mind at the fees committee meeting by even sitting there. Councilor Bagley, oh, wait a second, let's start with uh, Assistant Mayor Joe Kelly. You should absolutely recuse yourself. You have a direct conflict. Councillor Bagley, you have the perception of a problem. And it used to be in a galaxy far, far away and many eons ago that if there was a mere perception of a problem, one, had, one recused oneself. Now, Councillor Blaylock, last time I, I said that you might have a problem, but uh, you folks have had outdoor dining ever since your grandfather bought the place, which seems like 100 years ago now. But uh, so none of you have to worry about, uh, none of you have to worry about uh, 
ethics problems because this council, as a matter of fact, this, yeah, the mayor himself is ethically challenged because I can't tell you how many times the author and I have brought something up that was blatant, but nobody, no, it didn't happen. And so you folks don't have to worry about that at all. But, heck, for, the, for that matter, city staff by itself has no ethical bearings. I mean, Councilor Tabor, you had a problem and the mayor let you off the hook. Good Lord, how bad can this get? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next up, uh, Rob Capone on the Cable Commission. Excited about this. I'm sorry I only have three minutes. <laughs> Um, this is how we're going to fix cell service in, the, in Portsmouth. Say, yeah, no, I apologize first off that maybe it's not a completely appropriate, it's in public, but last time, I know this is third reading uh, on the ordinance change tonight, but I may have to leave, so I just thought, you know, let me get in early. So um, anyway, like I said, I'm going to read from a, a written statement just because I think it's going to go smooth. So anyway, I'm Rob Capone. Uh, Acting Chair of the uh, Cable and Telecommunications Commission. Uh, with me is Jason Hewitt, who's also a member. Uh, as you may know, the Cable Commission is primarily charged with negotiating the Cable Franchise Agreement, which is, the current agreement is from March 1st, 2019 to February 29th, 2024. Uh, we also advocate for Portsmouth residents when they have unresolved issues or complaints with their cable TV service. That's really the, the end all be all of most of our, our responsibilities. In reality, the majority of our time is spent negotiating the franchise agreement, which only renews about every five years. The exact time frame is part of the uh, agreement that is put into place. Uh, once completed, our responsibilities are relatively light. Over several cable commission meetings last year, we discussed that there was no real advocacy for Portsmouth internet or cellular users and suggested that perhaps this could be addressed by the cable commission. Uh, the current membership of the Cable Commission, both individually and together, have come to several re realizations. Uh, for starters, the current membership of the Cable Commission, Jason, Ash Chickery, uh, Luis, Red uh, Luis Rodriguez, and myself, are pretty technically savvy. Uh, as more Portsmouth residents cut the cord, we're representing a decreasing percentage of the Portsmouth population. Um, in the last 10 to 15 years, cellular and internet use has gone from a non-essential to indispensable. Um, service. Uh, while there is adequate competition for cellular service in the Seacoast region, remarkable, uh, remarkably there are some areas that have less than adequate cellular coverage, for instance in the parking lot of the uh, Portsmouth Hospital, which we find interesting. So, anyway, um, there is no real cellular or at internet advocacy group for Portsmouth residents and lastly, um, there doesn't appear to be any kind of unbiased collection of information for cellular and internet users. So therefore, we have suggested that the scope of the commission be expanded so that we may provide an increased service to the people of Portsmouth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Rob you got Capone it in the time. Of, Por of Portsmouth resident. Yep, well, we got that at the beginning. But thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, Lewis and, and Jason. And look forward to being able to do something when people uh, email the council and say our cell service uh, is less than desirable, although they use different language uh, than that. Um, we're going to, is Ian, uh, Ian Troost, are you a Portsmouth resident? You grew up here. Oh, yeah. All right, Ian. Yeah, you're, you're up. Hey. Yep. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Well, I, I split time between Portsmouth and, and Utah, so if they're technically... In the have, state of New Hampshire requires you to think of yourself as a resident here. So for, for those purposes, we'll let you go and that you're already um, talking. Um, I'm here to speak on uh, outdoor dining. Um, I was born and raised in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So I, I'm just going to read real quick what I wrote. And then I have a couple thoughts to extrapolate on that as well. Um, can you all hear me okay? Uh, we can. And, and you have two minutes and 45 seconds. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, so having grown up in Portsmouth, uh, I've witnessed tremendous change and growth over the last 10 years uh, and really my whole life, uh, some for the better and some for the worse. Uh, if we remove outdoor dining, um, it certainly will go down as one of the worst decisions for change that I can think of. COVID decimated the service industry, but as a community, we learned to grow with it and adapt. Outdoor dining has been one of the strongest changes to come in the last few years for Portsmouth, 
It makes Portsmouth more walkable, more vibrant, and more accessible to those who are immunocompromised or who want to be outdoors. While it takes away direct parking spaces, it also pushes folks to park in our new garage, the Foundry Garage, and allows them to walk and explore the town a bit more, which may lead to more business uh, for non-restaurant businesses. Outdoor dining becomes an economic driver in that sense as it gets more seating to restaurants and encourages more gathering and then allows people to walk, as I previously mentioned. Um, it allows for those visiting our town by the thousands to see how beautiful our community has become um, and how community oriented we are or should be. Uh, the city, in my opinion, is uh, supposed to facilitate growth and accessibility of our local businesses. Um, if I feel that if we're prioritizing parking spaces here and there um, over income that goes directly to our local businesses and their owners and their employees, um, that that's wrong. Um, we've built a new garage, so I, I feel that we should emphasize the use of it and drive folks to park there. Um, and I hope that we can find a sustainable yearly practice for our restaurant owners and service staff members um, who rely on the summers and the busy summers for, for a lot of their annual income. Um, to, to talk on that as well, I, I do want to just add, not only is it more accessible for those who are immunocompromised, but it's also more accessible for those who have mobility issues, um, who may need mobility assistance with a walker or wheelchair, um, as well as with service animals, um, as a previous resident mentioned. Um, then when it comes to uh, the fee discussion, I, I feel it's important to note that, uh, and this is in no way um, calling out any restaurants that are part of dining groups or, or you know, restaurateurs, but it, it will disproportionately affect mom and pop shops that maybe don't have as much capital um, to pay the higher fee if we are raising the fee. Um, and, and really what that does is it's, it's taking away money for those mom and pop restaurants to, um, you know, off the top of my head is my favorite restaurant, Durbar Square. Um, off the top of my head, it takes away money for their space to be more welcoming, their, uh, to go towards their employees, new equipment they may need. Um, and then uh, really what happens is if a, if a restaurant decides that they can't afford or they, you know, it really doesn't affect their bottom line as a, as a business or as an owner um, to pay the increased fee, uh, really what that affects is the employees, right? We have to take into consideration all the service members that, you know, comprise a large part of our town's workforce. Um, that's a lot of income that they might lose, right? Three to four extra tables or four to six or six to 10 extra tables, that's could be a whole nother server, a member of our service staff um, could, or it could just be more income split amongst the servers that currently exist. Thank you, Ian. Um, okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Have a great night. Uh, next up is uh, Irish Mike. Irish Mike, you gotta give your real name uh, and city of residence. Although I, I guess I don't know if legally you've changed your name to Irish Mike, but. Um, yeah, hi, uh, Mayor. This is uh, Mike, Mike Leharn and I'm on Orchard Street. Great. Can you hear? Yep, you have three Can minutes. Hello? Yep, you have three minutes. Yeah, I'm on Orchard Street. Uh, I, was, uh, I was at the last city council meeting and I was very disappointed. Uh, it, it was, uh, the last city council meeting was National Law Enforcement Day and I brought up the fact to uh, mentioned they, they thanked the law enforcement officers for the, job, the, the great work they did. And uh, even after bringing it up, it was, they were never thanked. That, that's one issue. And another issue was uh, when the when they, chief Dubois stepped down and they hired an, in, an interim chief, uh, there was a big to do. He, he was living in Manchester and the, the residents made a big do of it. Uh, how come you're living in Manchester and you're uh, a, a chief in Portsmouth, but he was, I don't think he ever, he just had the interim chief. And then when we hired the last chief, as soon as he was hired part of his contract, he had to reside in Portsmouth. And now we, we come up to Chief Newport and one of the part of his contract, well, part, in his contract that the city council approved in January of 21, it stated that he had to res reside in, Por in Portsmouth and he was also given a moving moving expense to live in Portsmouth. But uh, since he t t took the chief's position, he he's never re resided in Portsmouth. And I was wondering how come the city council hasn't looked into that? And uh, I, I think maybe that that's uh, it's, so, something that uh, the city council should look into. M maybe you can uh, 
have uh, Councillor Cook look into that, seeing as she's got time to trample over people's First Amendment rights, maybe she can look into why the chief isn't residing in Portland. Uh, 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 and it's a violation of his contract. Uh, it's grounds for ter de de termination. So th I think that should be looked into. And if if if, if, if he's got money for uh, living expenses and moving expenses, that should be returned to the city. Uh, thank you, and be safe, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, you uh, you, you might have missed it at last meeting, but I thank uh, the police for. Uh, on uh, Police Officer Appreciation Day, and I also thanked you uh, for bringing it to my attention. Um, so uh, with that, we've gotten through all of the, uh, the speakers on Zoom. Al, uh, uh, feel free to uh, come up and, and... Alex. Sorry, did you sign up? I did not. So you have to sign up okay. here. Uh, we'll go through the, the speakers and then uh, we'll... If, We'll, uh, we'll go to see if, how many folks are. And the reason I ask you to sign up, because we give three minutes, we have 45 minutes uh, for public comment. Um, so we try to allocate it. If we had 50 or 100 speakers, we'd shorten it. So we'll look through. I think we'll get you in. But uh, Al, you're up next. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Al Fleury. Uh, I own The Goat in, uh, right on Congress Street here. Uh, we've been there for seven years. I'm grateful. Uh, I firsthand witnessed the, the COVID thing, the outside dining. I was a part of it when it first got started. Um, I'm not a citizen here, uh, but I'm a property owner of a couple different properties in town, and I own two businesses here, and I, I've been coming to Portsmouth forever, love Portsmouth. Um, and this decision that we, that you, you all have to make uh, tonight or soon was brought to me by our patrons. Um, we try to be, and we set out to be seven years ago, a positive contribution to the West End. Uh, the previous two businesses before us, uh, unfortunately, did not make it. Um, and we, we've grown here. And, um, you know, I, I try to listen. I, and, I, and I listened to the, the two nice ladies that, that spoke before me and I don't want to rethink my business plan at all, but I certainly, you, you, can't, you can't forget what happened and you can't just not look at what a great thing that the outside dining has done for this city in particular. We're in multiple other cities. In this city, you have that walking vibrancy that other cities would love to have. You know, it, I know you guys amongst, uh, above everyone else see that. Um, the other woman spoke about the retail space, so we try to be very respectful of our neighbors. So we had the majority, if not all, email tonight. I actually have the last three or four. I don't know if I can still submit these, but I have the last four retail uh, butters of ours. So that's every a butter. because I feel like that's very important. Um, as every location is different, um, you are also faced with that decision. You know, We have a very unique location because we're using space um, that we don't know. And we accept and are willing to pay for that space. Perhaps, again, listening to Kevin, I understand what Kevin's saying, Kevin, Kevin Dwyer's. We're happy to pay for our space. I don't, um, that's not my driveway like it is Kevin. Maybe his can be discounted um, or something like that. Again, that's up to you. Um, I'm also like to just bring up the employment factor of this outside dining. We have to put in, we have to put on another three front of house, which is the waitresses uh, portion of our, of our staff for the outside dining. That created a whole plethora of jobs for the last couple of years as well as a back of house position. More than 50% of our staff comes from Portsmouth. Um, they're repeat kids, they're good kids, they're family people, they come in, they're locals, they walk to work. It, it's, it's a really good thing. Um, lastly, you know, I'd like to look, the hope that you would look at every, every uh, option for every specific outside dining application differently. Um, I know it's a hard decision, and I guess I'd like to ask the board to maybe, whether it's tenure or 
think about you know each individual um, without just you know broad brushing everybody together I understand that we're in a lane um, but you know again we went out and did the diligence and spoke to the fire and police uh, you know in DPW I understand that's a, an ask from them but we're willing to pay for the DPW portion and hoping that we don't infringe or ask any more of anybody else by taking up that lane and if it ever did become a problem we'd be happy to back off and I'd recuse that application but until it is um, would just like the opportunity to continue to be a good um, driver for the West West End we've never had a liquor violation we don't get in trouble with the police we've never we get along great with the fire department and we try to do a good job Thank you, Al. That's it. All right. Um, how many more people want to speak tonight? You raise your hand. Okay. Um, just come up to the microphone, state your name, um, city residence, and we'll. Yep, you go first. I know you're a Portsmouth resident, so. I am, for the last 30 years. Peter Harris, 249 Islington Street, about out outdoor dining. I think supporting. Business vitality is a great contribution to the local economy that restaurants are benefiting from, some apparently very well. And I ask for you to consider what about Portsmouth's other businesses? What about the shops? What's in it for them from the city? Some equivalent benefit should be provided in return. Why isn't this being discussed? I hear, I've heard some great points about it from Eliza Hewitt and from Esther from Petra. Um, what if local shops had this benefit and the restaurants didn't? What would the conversation be like? It seems like adverse selection. It's an insurance term, not a popular place to be when you don't benefit. Some restaurants have deep pockets and are capitalizing on this benefit as well to further their advantage. Closing, uh, um, and then cl closing in some streets by the Clipper uh, where uh, Pleasant Street and Court Street between uh, Pleasant between Court and State. That's tough, but that's a frequently used traffic area and has been a tough spot to get around when that closes. And then, what about restaurants outside this business area in Portsmouth that aren't getting this benefit? Just again, it seems like an adverse issue. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Hi, my name is Alex Choquette, and I apologize I didn't register ahead of time, but thank you for giving me a couple of minutes here. And just your city residence. I'm a resident in Portsmouth. I live on Vaughn Street. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say to the board and the mayor here, thank you, thank you, thank you. Outdoor dining has been amazing. My wife and I, we go out every night of the week, sometimes too much, but we go out. We also do a lot of shopping. We do a lot of eating. We do a lot of shopping. We have fun. We have friends that come in town. We love what you've done in Portsmouth. Not just with the outdoor dining, but everything else. You guys are nailing it. Ladies, thank you. You've done an amazing job in Portsmouth. There are some issues to be concerned about, but at the end of the day, we have a great, vibrant city, the best city in the world in my, in my mind, and I travel a ton. I always come back to Portsmouth, and I'm happy to be home. And I just want to say thank you for all the restaurants and everybody you support and the residents, and I appreciate your listening. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I definitely agree. Best city in the world. Um, all right. Um, with that, uh, we're uh, we're going to go on. I don't. Maybe it makes sense yeah, to. I'd like to move to spend the rules to bring forward items 15B, which is the report back from the fees committee on outdoor dining, and then items 15D1 and 2, which are Councillor Bagley's and Cook's items on outdoor dining. There's a second. One second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so um, what we did there, we're talking about outdoor dining uh, out, uh, out of order of the agenda, so we're going to talk about that now. All right. B committee? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we did meet. We had, f I'll cover five topics. The discussion, we agreed the fees should apply to <coughs> the se shorter season that we have in the motion now. Um, we agreed the fees should encourage outdoor dining as a larger economic good, and we envisioned fees lower than the $3,000 per parking space that the staff recommended. We talked about 
uh, costs for a parking space ranging from $1,500 to $2,000 with rates per square foot aligned accordingly. Um, so that was our price range. Uh, we clearly saw this as um, a beneficial use of the public, the public walkways and, and the streets, um, which needs to outweigh simply the desire for to recover parking revenue. And lastly, we talked about lane closures in the fee committee. We didn't have a consensus on that. That's a council decision we figured. And we didn't have a consensus on the sidewalk fees. Um, and we can get into that later. But um, that was the essence of our discussion. I think and I'll Taylor. see if Councillor Den wants to add anything. I'll simply add that we did not vote on moving anything forward because there wasn't a consensus. So the default was Councillor Bagley and Councillor Cook bringing their motion back as their own agenda items. Correct. And it might be something to look for in the future of why we have two people on the fee committee. <laughs> uh, we might want to add a third person. Um, just if the governance committee is looking for things to do, we might, we might want to revisit having more than uh, we'll have odd numbers on that. Councilor Bagley and then Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, in light of uh, Councilor Denton and Councilor Tabor's uh, explanation, I would motion to adopt the outdoor dining policy as described in the packet. And if I get a second, I'll speak to it. Second. Is that out of order? Would we want to do item A first, the larger picture? Mm. Oh, that, I'll, yeah, I would like to rescind my motion. Motion rescinded. Second. Agreed. Councilor Cook. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, we'll start with the first motion. Um, move to include the downtown area bounded by Deer Street, the Piscataqua River, Prescott Park, Court Street and Maplewood Avenue Middle Street in the redesign of the Market Square in 2023 with the goal of enhanced pedestrian access with expanded sidewalks, expanded sidewalk dining throughout downtown, and reduced traffic congestion, including a possible redesign of traffic flow, including two-way traffic on State Street. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Cook, your motion. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I am just including, we're including this motion as part of a discussion around outdoor dining because we've heard repeatedly from residents that the desire is really to expand sidewalks in the city so that we can have more places in the city where we have outdoor dining without taking up parking spots, without taking up loading zones, without taking um, lanes off the street. And we know that we have challenges downtown with traffic and speeding. And some of our roadways were designed at a time when the downtown was really uh, a passageway um, to get through town. We wanted to enhance that passageway so that people could get through town quickly. And now downtown is a destination place. So the goal is to enhance the pedestrian um, walkability of the downtown, which would be in line with our our uh, bike ped plans in the city, and also to provide more space for sidewalk outdoor dining. Uh, the Market Square redesign has been in the works for several years, but was postponed due to the COVID pandemic. We have an opportunity now, we're looking at redesigning this. We wanna make sure that in redesigning Market Square, we're thinking about all the streets around Market Square and how they feed into the Market Square in the long run. So that is the goal of this motion. Thank you, Councilor Cook. Councilor Blaylock, we'll go up the line. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I know this has been in the CIP um, and it has been delayed. I know we wanted to delay changing Market Square until after we celebrated the 400th anniversary. Um, my only worry on this, and I'm all for uh, making Market Square downtown area better and incorporating all these other improvements that we are making, these other changes, this outdoor dining. Um, I'm all for making downtown more pedestrian friendly. Um, and I know city staff are supposed to look at um, the two possible two-way traffic on State Street. My only worry here is um, 
I don't know what if we're trying to do three things at once. If we're you know if this is going to cost money um, to the taxpayer, or if, you know that's that was my concerns here that we're we're trying to do too much stuff and it's going to cost the taxpayer and um, those are my concerns. Thanks, Councilor Bullock. Uh, Councilor Lombardi. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, the Assistant Mayor and I at the um, EDC meeting brought uh, this up as well, and there's interest there to um, have the EDC uh, look at it from a business point of view um, in those areas. Um, I, they have not moved to do anything specific, but I would hope that we could look at look for them or uh, to you know give us some advice uh, come back to the council with some advice from a business point of view thank you council Lombardi. sounds a good idea uh, councillor Bagley yeah thank you your honor and uh, thank you councillor cook for bringing this forward I think uh, on parking traffic and safety we just had a Fleet Street redevelopment presentation which is still a couple years away and realistically speaking, Market Square redevelopment is a couple of years away because of the 400 and because of how long time takes to plan. So if you're looking at this view from 30,000 feet, you're totally redoing Fleet Street. You're totally do redoing Market Square. It may make sense to incorporate Congress Street, which connect those two, plus one more block to get to um, the intersection as part of doing all three things, maybe not necessarily at once, but the planning and layout and design all together as one package and I think that's I don't want to speak for Councilor Cook but that that certainly was my hope is that we design all these things together and then maybe we implement them phased if need be thank you Councilor Bagley uh, assistant mayor thank you your honor. my uh, question would be for city manager and potentially DPW director Peter Rice have we done a study before and if so when was the last one my understanding is that we have done with one within the last potential decade or so of a of the two-way um, conversion of a two of the two-way on State Street uh, let me take that and say that we've um, hired a consultant to look at that uh, this the results are still pending we expect a, a preliminary report back from them but if I may since I have the microphone I just want to mention that this is um, the, the, the effort contemplated in this motion is a whole lot bigger than the amount of money we have set aside currently which is a hundred thousand dollars there is fifty thousand dollars more in the current CIP request for FY 24 um, but that we just put in as a placeholder to understand the implementation of additional public space for outdoor dining uh, within the current footprint of the scope of work if the scope of work were to expand to include this entire area uh, we would need um, a great deal more amount of money it almost amounts to a, a downtown master plan so we, we we would just want the council to be mindful of that if the ask is bigger the the need for dollars will be bigger thank, thank you. you city manager councilor denton thank you Honor. i'm in full support of exploring what's possible downtown for years i love the concept of potentially closing downtown to vehicular traffic during certain parts of the day like a lot of cities do i think this is a big step in that direction and the first step would be a study and like the city manager just said um, that in the CIP there's currently plans to continue doing the study and the question would then become how much would we have to increase funding in the upcoming year for that study by I think uh, planning to and sustainability director Peter Britt said probably around fifty thousand dollars but if it's more I think the city would be willing I can't speak for other counselors but I'd be willing to consider spending that money in the CIP to see what a study comes back with Thank you, Councilor Denton. Councilor Moreau. Um, look, considering I actually was the one who brought up the study for the State Street to move the southbound traffic right. and make it two way. You're paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's I was originally my request of which is what is being worked on now, and I'm very eager to get the results of um, that request. But I do feel like that was step one. Um, I think this is definitely maybe. A really big bite of the apple to chew to plan it all at once I get the idea of wanting to but I think taking it in steps and step one would be to get the traffic flow of route one from the bridge down State Street once we do that then I'm all for looking at especially from Market Square down Congress Street how we can make that a little bit more like what's in front of the music hall someplace you can drive you can park 
you can have outdoor dining, B, just much more multi-usable space that has really most days only one lane of traffic because it doesn't have Route 1 coming through it. You drive to go somewhere, you don't drive through it. Um, so that's always been my thought process in looking at the whole redesign. So opening this up, as long as you know we're not biting off more than we can chew in, in order to get it done, um, maybe even designing needs to be done in phases. Maybe we take Market Square down Congress as phase one and then look at expanding outside those areas for a future phase. But that would be, I just don't, don't want us to bite off more than we can chew all at the same time. Yeah, so on that, I have, a, I guess, a quick question for either Councilor Cook or mm -hmm. Councilor Bagley. Councilor Bagley, you did state at the beginning, it, you know, it makes sense to include Congress, which is connecting Market Square and Fleet Street. But the scope of this is significantly more uh, than that. Where I would definitely agree, we should, you know, you know, take all, um, you know, roads into Rome. There, uh, you know, Pleasant uh, Market, Congress. I don't know if you know. This seems like a downtown master plan more than expanding the scope of Market Square uh, to include the the inlets and outlets of Market Square. Either one of you want to take. I guess why it, it grew to include all of the downtown in the Market Square redevelopment, Councilor Cook. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, what what I was trying to do is to encompass all the streets that people would be traveling on in order to reach Market Square. So you don't want to do a design for Market Square that then is not appropriate once you decide to change a street that's approaching Market Square or change a direction of a, st a street like State Street, or once you decide to um, maybe expand sidewalks on Congress Street, you want to make sure that the planning for Market Square fits with the planning all around Market Square. Um, so I think that we have to be thinking very deliberately in the Market Square plan. It impacts all the streets around it. So I just want to be really, really careful, and and that's why we left the bounds that big. That's why I did in that motion. Um, it wasn't because we needed to do planning on Middle Street or we need to do planning on Court Street or we need to do planning on Bowes Street necessarily, Piscataqua. It's that we need to be thinking about the market square is encompassing the area around it as well and be planning within that area. Yeah. And, and just for, I'll go to Council Moreau um, or Council Tabor, did you have your hand up? Okay, I'll go to you in a second. Just for folks that are, are tuning in at home and hearing us talk about market square and where we're studying streets, I just want to highlight we're talking about this because um, it, it impacts outdoor dining and the decisions that we're going to make future. If we can fit parking and outdoor dining in there uh, because we widen the sidewalks and narrow the streets and everybody's happy and, and we all go home. Um, so that's why we're having this conversation first because we want to uh, put that out there that we're thinking about eventually, you know, in 10 years and we have outdoor dining, what does it look like? Um, because, you know, it's I think our significant hope it doesn't look like a ton of Jersey barriers uh, out in our downtown. That would be the, you know, the, the long-term uh, goal. But Councilor Tabor. Thanks, Your Honor. Um, before we get to a total no street left behind approach, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, every time we expand pedestrian space and sidewalks, we win. That was true when we first did Market Square in the 70s. Uh, I think that's the opportunity with the Market Square study. It seems we've got two competing elements that might be better done separately. Would it make sense, well, I'll ask this as a question of city manager, would it make more sense to take an expanded market square look at the streets in that vicinity from the point of view of where can we expand sidewalks? Where can we make more pedestrian space? And then separate from that, we have traffic studies on two-laning and uh, of State Street and things like that. So, you know, maybe not try to go down both tracks at once, but first, where's our opportunity to make the city more pedestrian friendly and create more experience for, for people on foot to dine, to walk, to do whatever? And that may guide uh, what space is available for traffic flow. Would that make sense? I certainly think that's reasonable, and if that's the direction the council 
um, ask staff to go on that. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Council Tabor, you got that in a motion or? So I would uh, propose a friendly amendment that we uh, expand the market square study to uh, the streets that you've defined from the point of view of increased pedestrian and sidewalk usage, uh, followed by traffic study of uh, circulation and possible two-way streets that are now one way. Does that friendly amendment, Councilor Cook or Councilor Bagley? I'm okay with it, but I have a question. And Okay. That um, I believe the two-way study in State Street might already be underway, so maybe we could take that last component of your friendly amendment. Need off. not be sequential. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or maybe just remove the other aspects of study. We're not going to change a two-way street just like in a vacuum, okay. guys. Like they're not. I mean, we'll we'll do the study. The whole study includes everything else. So I think, Councillor Tabor, if you leave it at you know, expanding the pedestrian and walkability uh, as a part of the greater market square areas defined by Congress Pleasant and Market, uh, we got a winner. Let's go with that. Councilor Cook? Um, I, I think also Daniel. You have to be thinking about Daniel, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does, that does connect in there. <laughs> yeah. I just want to make sure streets. that we're thinking about all the streets that um, hit. Yeah, Daniels definitely <laughs> comes into Market Square, <laughs> yeah. for sure. Don't leave that one behind. <laughs> yep, so Daniel, Market, Pleasant, Congress. Mm -hmm. Thank you. To be included in the study of Market Square. Yeah. And That's city man and maybe um, from a, a CIP standpoint, we ask for a um, report back on the cost estimate of that for the next work session on the CIP. Is that fair, City Manager? I think it is. Um, if, if Peter Rice had the microphone, he would remind folks that the two items are actually interconnected and it's hard to determine widening or narrowing opportunities without directly and, and in a correlating manner determining the impact to traffic. So let us put together a comprehensive report back for you, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Happy to do that. All right. So we're now voting on uh, an amended uh, motion to include these streets as a report back uh, ahead of our next CIP uh, meeting, if possible. Which is the next, next meeting. meeting. Which is the next meeting. I was going to say that's Wednesday, so is that feasible? Uh, no, that's budget. Uh, oh, okay. CIP right. hearing is on February 6th. Okay. We all in agreement? Or, or all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. I think we need to pass the main motion now. No, because that was a friendly amendment. Oh, you're right. Okay. Was, Thank you. We made them up, these friendly amendments. Val hates them. She's got to go back and change her notes. <laughs> Any clerk hates these friendly amendments, but we, but they are so supportive of us. So thank you, Val. <laughs> um, all right. Um, the floor is still yours, uh, Councillor Cook and Councillor Bagley, for the real meat and potatoes of the next uh, Sample motion two, move to adopt the attached proposed policy on outdoor dining. Uh, I move to approve, an ex oh, sorry, move to adopt an, the attached proposed policy on outdoor dining. Hopefully Second. I, and then I'll speak to it very quickly. I think we've talked about this since early December, probably three or four council meetings. Um, we talked about it in the fee committee we received over 200 emails. Uh, by my calculations, 141 of them were residents. 96% of those emails were in favor of outdoor dining. Um, some emails were, were short, some were quite lengthy. Uh, the only other topic that really came up for discussion um, in any significant way was the traveled lanes outdoor dining. And we received just under 50 uh, regarding that, and 67% were in favor. Uh, which means the remainder were opposed. The other two things that came up, but not in any significant number, was the, the fees and the seasons. Uh, there really wasn't a lot of uh, discussion about that. Just a few emails touched on both of them. So I think we've got a very solid framework 
that we can move forward with tonight. The other thing I would mention is, you know, this happened in 2020. There was a, a group of people put together by Bob White called the Design Alliance Professionals. And they put together a, a fantastic PDF of how we bring outdoor dining to our downtown without closing any streets. And I would say there's probably a thousand hours of, of architects, engineers, street people, like uh, people that just really knew their craft, put this all together. And when the city council uh, approved the task force, I believe it was the very first task force meeting, they got this document and they were able to hit the ground running with this document. So that's kind of how this all started. Over the past three years, we've adjusted and evolved it. This will be year four. So um, I'm not making that motion tonight, but I would say uh, we should pass something tonight and then we should midpoint of the summer bring it back for three readings and an ordinance because I think we'll have four years of data and we'll know if what we pass tonight is, is working or not working. Thank you, Councilor Bagley. Councilor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in introducing this uh, City Council policy, um, I wanted to preface the discussion tonight by letting everyone know that we came forward with this policy because we wanted to strike a balance between um, continuing outdoor dining as is, which is kind of um, my preference, not changing <laughs> fees, not changing, and finding balance with the report back we receive from the planning department. So what you find in the policy is a little bit of give here and there. Um, where we where we made some compromises um, based upon city recommendations. Um, that doesn't mean that we took all the recommendations. And I think it's really important that um, we reflect, reflect on what this does for the, the outdoor dining policy in general. It, it brings us um, basically to a position where we're looking at uh, a policy rather than just an annual renewal. Um, it has us thinking about what do we want it to look like in the future, which was uh, part of the outdoor dining presentation to us that we need to be thinking about what it looks like downtown and making that consistent across the city. But it also um, keeps the fees at $1,500 um, and $5 per square foot in an effort to allow restaurateurs the extra funds that they might need this year to upgrade their space to fit with the design guidelines. Um, and we know it's fairly expensive to do that. We know that put, building a platform, as we've been told by one restaurateur, costs $6,000. So um, because we know that that's expensive, we don't want to increase fees and ask restaurateurs at the same time to also come up with more money to make their space more accessible. And we want outdoor dining to be accessible to everyone. So I think it's very important that when you're thinking about this, realize that it is a balance. Um, and we were trying, trying to strike the right balance here. Thank you, Councilor Cook. Assistant Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I would uh, ask legal, um, as I did last year, um, is if, as we know, I own a, a coffee shop, as I have from since 2018 downtown. Um, before outdoor dining on street, uh, we used what um, the city has always had, which is their outside cafe. So we have always had outdoor um, seating. Uh, so I would ask legal is if, um, if um, they advise whether I vote or not vote on this, or the ability to vote or not vote on this. So, um the crux of the issue is whether you're going to have additional um, income from this and that would affect your vote. And if you, it, you would be any different from any other business owner downtown, which you would not be. Um, and the direct impact into your business is speculative at, at best. So I would say legally you do not have a conflict of interest, but if it's up to you, to decide how you feel about that. Thank you. Um, and moving on from that, if I may, Your Honor. It's been touched on uh, a few times tonight about retailers. Uh, if those who have been following along months ago, uh, I actually brought up the idea of potentially opening up this program to retailers um, and asked um, at that time 
uh, for the planning department to look into that too. I think it's very important. Uh, in front of me, I have a few letters from retailers. Um, I would just like to comment on one of them. Uh, the owner of Moonshine, Mary, wrote in that, um, in summary, uh, it massively sl slows down traffic in front of her business, which she, uh, she appreciates. She feels that sometimes she sees people zooming down Congress at all times of the year, and she's noticed a huge change when the seating zone is in place. She believes it creates a safer zone in front of her business and in the end of Congress. It's a huge draw for tourists and locals. It's generally lovely and enjoyable. I think it's important, too, that we remember that while outdoor dining was started, uh, this portion of outdoor dining, I think it's also very important to remember that we've had outdoor dining. We've had sidewalk dining in the city for a very long time. So when we discuss this new expansion of of outdoor dining, it is on, it's the on-street version or addition of outdoor dining. Um, I think sometimes that gets lost in our, in our memory that we have had sidewalk, cafe, and outdoor dining for a really long time. Uh, it is important that we also look at, as, as Councillor Tabor has said and has been said numerous times, the walkability, the vibrancy of our town. It is more than just um, the speculative benefit of of restaurant owners or restaurant tours. It's about the long-term viability and what we really would like our city to be. Um, and I, I think it's very, very important that we, that we understand and acknowledge that there are plenty of retailers who also do support this. And it's, it's very important that we do not, um, and, and I think from, as Councillor Bradley said, over the 200 emails that we have received, um, it's very important that we don't place parking over, over the desires of our residents. It's also very clear, uh, as Councillor Bagley has, has shared with us, that parking revenue was up. So as we, as we talk about the pros versus cons versus in, in fees, um, we know there's no lost parking revenue. That, that is a bl point blank uh, fact. So I think you know, as, as we look to balance what our fees are going to be, we also have to look at the community we're trying to create. And I think it's very important that that, for me, in any vote that I cast, will be the leader of the reason to support or not support outdoor dining and the expansion of the program. Thank you very much, Assistant Mayor. Councillor Denton. Thank you, I have a question for the same manager and then a comment. Um, how much revenue was generated this past year by the dining establishments which impeded a flow of traffic lane? The answer to that question is just over $25,000, and that would include one, two, three, four, five restaurants. Six, really, because two are combined. Tw over 25000 Thank you. And if I may make a motion. I motion to delete the first sentence in paragraph four and to reestablish the diagonal crosswalk at the intersection of Congress and Middle Street. And if there's a second, I could speak to that, and I'll gladly read what that first sentence was so the public knows. Second. Uh, would you mind just reading the, the, the motion or the, yeah. the new paragraph as uh, would be constructed? So paragraph four, prohibited, would then simply read, in circumstances in which street closure will cause a burden to public safety operations, the city manager has the authority to deny the permit. I get it. <laughs> <And if I laughs> so she makes the decision, yeah. not us. Okay. So, right. I can speak to that. So <coughs> this would eliminate the requirement which this creates regarding the one, below $1,000, 1,000 vehicles per day. So this would essentially mean at the same manner's discretion uh, due to safety concerns, um, outdoor dining where it existed this prior year would still be able to exist in um, travel lanes even if impacted. And the reasons for me combining these two items, this and the diagonal crosswalk, is several fold. Um, first, it's more fair to all of the establishments that they'll be able to put in for outdoor dining. Um, second, as the same manager just said, uh, those establishments actually generated $25,000 of revenue for the city. Uh, third, uh, as the assistant mayor just said, one of the businesses commented, is, Outdoor dining slows vehicles down, so the restaurants on Congress slow down all the traffic approaching that intersection, making it far more safe. However, 
When it comes to that intersection itself, and I know the Parking Traffic and Safety Committee are currently looking at it. They've got numerous complaints about it. The way it's now set up, I think it's a staggered where people are turning. People don't necessarily know what's going on, which makes it safer by all intents. If you don't know what's going on, you're going to slow down when you approach an intersection. However, it doesn't feel safe. And if people don't feel safe approaching an intersection, they're simply not going to think it's safe. And if we went back to the way the intersection used to be set up where all four directions stop travel and then people could cross in any which direction they want, um, makes far more sense if the outdoor dining was allowed to continue in front of flatbread, the goat, and jumping jays. That way all the traffic stops and people could then cross because it's no longer impeding a line of vision. We've got Peter Rice. Well, if, if I may, <laughs> I've asked Peter to come down because yeah. I think um, we have two issues at play here. When you no longer allow that third travel lane as a viatic use and you shut it down for dining, coupled with an all stop, which would be the only other alternative at that large intersection, that will create massive traffic problems. I'm going to let Peter. C speak correct. To that. that that would queue up. That would push the queue back across Fleet Street. Um, the the whole discussion relative to um, that intersection and the, the pedestrian signals is is a perception issue. We've reviewed traffic safety data, reviewed video pre-changing of that intersection, and we've seen a reduction in jaywalking. We've seen a reduction in in, in potential accidents, and it has not made things more dangerous. It has improved the function of that intersection. It is a perception that um, is really, um, it's a change that people don't like. Um, Peter, on, on so that? It, it's it's could, very difficult uh, for us to, our department, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, it's very difficult for our department to, to, to continue to evaluate this and continue to explain and show that the data doesn't support the opinion that this is not a safe functioning uh, pedestrian um, intersection. So um, on that, and, and I would ask uh, Councillor Denton to uh, hopefully remove this portion of that because it's going to get kind of well out over our skis in terms of us uh, making decisions from a, uh, the one time I really felt like I, I messed up on the council, I mean, I felt, I'm sure this, others think many, many other times, uh, but on the fly I asked for a, I asked for a uh, a crosswalk or a lighted crosswalk at some council meeting a couple of years ago. Then I went hat in hand and apologized to the PTS for, you know, kind of usurping the power. We have a process to go through that if we wanted to bring it back. I would say, Peter, on that, I would hope to be able to see that the uh, the cross, the, the flashing beacon for the walk sign was closer uh, to the yellow arrow as it is uh, down on the intersection of Maplewood um, and Deer Street, it's it's further away. It's under it's it's much further away actually. If it could be closer, I think cars would be uh, more aware of that. But again, uh, a separate conversation, and I would hope that we could we could pull this out um, and have a discussion simply on uh, giving the city manager the authority to approve or deny travel lane um, uh, requests. Thank you, uh, DPW Director PRS. Are in agreement that's perception but I will withdraw the second half of my motion, so it will simply read, motion to delete the first sentence in paragraph four of the policy. And is the second agree with that? Who is the second on that? Assistant Mayor? Yes. Okay, um, any, uh, so before I, uh, I'll, no, we'll go, Actually, I'll state this because this is how this has played out in the past, and it's worth uh, before we have any discussion. If the city manager feels as though she has a um, a uh, a decision that could go either way, uh, that's going to come back before the city council, much as it had from the standpoint of uh, the outdoor dining, uh, the expansion of um, uh, what do we call it? What is it now? Um, the uh, uh, I really don't want to call it breaking new grounds. Um, uh, Tuscan, Tuscan Market. Tuscan Market. Um, Teddy's lunch. So yeah, the, uh, Cafe, Cafe Brioche. Brioche. We've got them all here. <laughs> um, so uh, so knowing just to be clear, it's not we don't pass things the city manager uh, 
because we don't want to make the decision. The decision is going to come back to us because this is a, a split. Where I would be supportive of this is I think a thousand cars is such an arbitrary number as to not be arbitrary. And it includes one, and it doesn't include the other you know, ones. And I don't think that we should be in the, the position of making decisions based on uh, you know, what's going to, how do we define it so it, it, it kicks them out. I would like to see, um, but that's it. That, uh, Councilor Bagley, we'll go uh, to you. Thanks, Your Honor. I will um, speak first to the intersection. Um, I believe at 6.30 on February 2nd, uh, we're going to have a parking traffic and safety meeting, and hopefully we'll have a presentation on that intersection and uh, yet another explana explanation of what a leading pedestrian interval is versus an all-stop uh, interval. What happens at that intersection is it feels more dangerous, and there are actually more conflicts. Like when somebody goes to take that right, there'll be people on the sidewalk and they get upset However, if you look at it over a long period of time, that conflict doesn't result in a death or a serious injury the vast majority of time. When somebody has to wait a very long time for a, a crosswalk signal, signal, what they will do, uh, not everybody, but statistically what most people will do is they will cross against the signal. And if they get hit when they're crossing against the signal, that traffic's moving at 30, 40 miles an hour, and they have a very high likelihood of a very serious injury or death. So it feels less safe, um, and we can't really fix that. However, statistically, and with the over 100 hours of videotape review that our traffic engineers have looked at, it, it is a safer intersection from the, the standpoint of serious injuries and deaths. So I, I just wanted to put that out there because I know it comes up a lot. Um, I, I would support this motion. I think the 1,000 dollar number is a bit arbitrary, or a thousand car number is a bit arbitrary. We had a situation where uh, one establishment out of the five that did on-street dining actually had the ability to use parking spaces in front of their restaurant. But it wouldn't really make sense because the adjacent area, um, just it just makes more sense for a lot of reasons. For instance, when Hill Street is closed, we have a problem in that neighborhood where people park and then walk into town. So when they're looking for parking at the Bridge Street lot, they don't find it. They go past Hill Street, they turn into that neighborhood park and walk out. If you close Hill Street in the summertime, when this is the biggest issue, those people go on to the garage and park there. Um, and I, I will say the, um, there was an overwhelming amount of support from the Islington Creek neighborhood, I would say, in the emails. So that's, that's always a good thing. And uh, I'm rambling, I'm sorry. Uh, All right. So I, yeah, I, I guess I would say I'll, I'll support this. Uh, Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, we put in this limitation uh, due to the request from the planning director in the report to the council. Um, there was concern uh, about traffic flow downtown, specifically in certain locations. And the, the locations that um, I get the most complaints about as a city councilor and that I've received the most complaints about are Pleasant Street and Fleet Street. Right. And that's who we've heard from too in emails is people concerned about uh, road closures or changes, basically changes in traffic direction because you're eliminating a lane so you can only go one way um, on both Pleasant and Fleet Street. I haven't received the same response on Congress Street. But then again, on Congress Street, we are not changing the flow of traffic. We still have two lanes going in the same direction they've always been going. So there might be another way to address this rather than just eliminating the requirement, rather than adding a, a stipulation that it changes the flow of traffic as well, or the direction of traffic on that street. City Manager. Your Honor, I, I think I would want to stand firmly on the side of staff and the recommendation we've made year after year uh, post-2020 when this was no longer under the, exec uh, the emergency order of the governor in that um, the only use for viatic ways are vehicular use. It's not appropriate. It's not safe. It impacts uh, travel flow. And from a across the board perspective, staff and I do not support dining in the travel lane. So I would not want the authority to have to weigh in on that because I would say no to all of them and, and we'd be back here in front of you. So I just want to make that very clear that um, 
in order to support the recommendation of staff, in, this would be the third year recommend, supporting that recommendation. I, I would not want that authority because I, I would tell you that I would not allow dining in the traveling on in any circumstance. Council Bova. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I, I support the staff's recommendations um, on this. I do. I like to think of myself as a man about town. I usually am downtown at least once a day. Um, but I know a lot of these business owners. I know a lot of the patrons. I know a lot of residents, the butters, the shop owners. Um, I've gotten most people support <coughs> Congress Street and Hill Street. I think most do not support Pleasant Street and uh, Fleet Street. Um, but that is the percent. That is feedback I've gotten, and that's that's what I will support. So, um, so is uh, how the sausage gets made. Um, what if we had a? Um, what if we expanded the the scope of the um, the market square study so as to uh, have a trial with a reduced travel lane um, on Congress Street, allowing for more uh, more dining um, on the the, the west end of that, um, you know, because I guess like the um, always tried to make this move towards a permanent solution, one that doesn't have Jersey barriers, that doesn't have, um, you know, high, very well designed, but uh, hard to see around uh, platforms that are difficult to uh, maneuver around. If we were to have, as part of the first um, study, the CIP, um, come back and say we'd like to investigate uh, looking at Congress Street uh, in particular um, to narrow that, that travel lane, uh, would that change your opinion, City Manager, on the, um, on the, the only vehicular use of the, the road? It would, but we, but it wouldn't be a, be something to be done in this, in this dining season, to study it and then to implement it. Um, you know, as many of us have talked about, it might make a whole lot of sense to make Congress Street a whole lot less wide for vehicles. You've got a ton of roadway width, all the way from Market Square at least down to Fleet Street, where it starts to pinch down. You, you really could take advantage of a whole lot of things, but they, but those aren't things that we could a design and b implement in this construction season. So I'm just being the realist. I'm not looking to squash outdoor dining. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking to support the safest routes, uh, you know, use of the streets, and that's in consultation with the staff. So the council could decide certain streets to do this on uh, and not to do this on. Um, but if left to me, I would, I would say no to all of them, and they would come back to you. Councilor Moreau. It was my concern that putting the city manager in that position to make that final decision. So could we implement if somebody wishes to um, do something in a travel way that they automatically that application has to come before us with the public hearing so that we can hear what the public really wants for specific restaurants and what they're proposing? Would that be a bad idea? Just throwing that there for discussion. Councilor Denton, do you have an idea whether that's good or a bad idea? I have an idea how to, I guess, eliminate the city manager's concern about her having final decision when she's already decided, which would be just eliminating paragraph four altogether, which would still leave with her the authority to set additional restrictions and requirements in paragraph five, but it would not put her in the box where the city council would vote one way and then she would be put in a position to do the opposite. Okay, so I don't know if it's the, and the uh, city manager can uh, certainly speak for herself, but if I were to paraphrase what I heard, it wasn't that it's a, you know, if there's not a, you know, she's not afraid of making the decision or shirking away. She thinks it's a bad idea uh, to put dining in travel lanes. Um, I think the, uh, where we are um, in agreement, uh, at least from what I can tell, it's a bad idea to close travel lanes in a, um, without any ability to reroute uh, cars, meaning Pleasant and Fleet Street. 
that's where we got the vast, vast majority of complaints, and we are beholden to uh, you know people that that want to see their will executed executed, executed through uh, through us. Um, where I believe the uh, staff has been uh, clear is that any travel lane, you know, outside of a, um, a pandemic, um, is going to be uh, a bad a bad idea. So. Um, the idea of bringing it before the council, you know, we can always overrule as we've done the last three years, but I don't know um, if that's, I don't know, city manager, did I paraphrase you well enough? You did, and in the previous years it was when when um, the, 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 the direction or the flow of traffic was reversed or changed, correct. Um, I think, just to give my opinion, I think it would be awfully unwieldy to have a public hearing every time there was a request. It, it, it really would put the burden on the council to act and it would put the burden on the restaurants to act in a timely fashion. I think it's just less clean to do it that way. Okay. Oh, Councillor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, perhaps I could make a suggestion uh, to Councillor Denton that he propose, uh, rescind his motion and propose two new ones, namely that we allow uh, on street dining for all restaurants that previously had it and if that were not to pass he could uh, make a second motion specific to congress street but that's a i mean i would say that that's not a policy like we're we're working on like we can't have a policy of yeah. you know would why don't we start where we have an agreement uh, if we changed paragraph four to establishments may not conduct outdoor dining uh that closes a travel line period or, or changes the flow of traffic or changes the flow or uh, eliminates changes the direction of traffic changes that changes the direction of traffic so the questions would that include narrowing and eliminating the left turn lane on Congress Street um, establishments may not uh, conduct outdoor dining that reverses uh, the flow of traffic period not would allow that so it would just reverses direction I'm, I'm fine with that. Mm. Okay. And if that, and Councillor Cook, I'll get to you one second. If that, um, we still might not see um, the uh, outdoor dining in a travel lane uh, through administrative uh, uh, discretion. Um, but it allows the conversation to continue, which is I'm sensing the will of the council. Councilor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm fine with that, but I would make sure that we include the rest of the phrase there, except on any street or way in which the traffic count is below a thousand cars per day and with such additional and special conditions. And like, so we keep the, that there. And the reason that I'm asking to keep the rest of it is that um, we didn't have complaints about Hill Street, and Hill Street effectively stops the flow of traffic. So you don't want to get into a position where you're, um, by accident, um, getting rid of a location that benefits the neighbors and stops flow of traffic. I think that the the recommendation is fine otherwise, because it still works. I would say. Technically, stopping and reversing are different, but uh, um, Your Honor, Councilor Boyle. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, possibly, we could suggest any two-way street uh, does not eliminate one of the directions. Would that work? No, because it has Hill Street. I'm just trying to find a good. Yeah, I don't. Well, it seems like we're. Um, the the complaints we got mostly were in front of Pleasant and um, and and Please. Fleet Street, um, which turned two way to a one way. Which turned two way into one way. I don't know. Is Hill Street a two way or one way? Um, they're both normally two way, and they were reduced to or changed to one way. And that seems to be the genesis of the complaints. Right, but Hill Street, and oh, I see what you're saying. Which, I think if you, if you keep the thousand cards in there, then you you cover that section. Yeah, I guess the 
Um, yeah. All right. Any other? Councilor Dunn? Yep. By changing impedes a travel lane to reverses travel lane, I believe the assistant mayor is correct in saying that it would not impact Hill Street if we keep the remainder except on any street or way in which the traffic count is below 1,000 cars per day because that essentially says you can't reverse travel but if it's less than a thousand cars a day, then you could actually impact it. Mm. So that would address the concern of reversing travel on Fleet Street and on Pleasant Street because it reverses it, but it's over a thousand. But Hill would be an example where it's under a thousand. So simply by changing the word, again, impedes to reverses. This would essentially just eliminate outdoor dining on Fleet and Pleasant. Mm -hmm. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. I think Thank we you. have four or five motions on the floor, and um, we may want to have some of those rescinded um, and and go forward with the latest. Uh, yep. So suggestion. Val, where are we right now? So I actually only have the main motion, and then I have Councilor Denton's. Um, motion which he rescinded the second part of it and then the mayor informally added yeah i didn't make something. a motion he so it had make to pass a motion it. so okay um i was waiting for maybe the second right. to make things cleaner <laughs> i'll withdraw my initial amendment and if there's a second second i'll simply amend the word impedes to reverses. So just change those two words. Got it. And the remainder of that whole the remainder would paragraph stays. Stays the same. Okay. Councilor Cook. Uh, Your Honor, um, I, I wanted to address this concern around the thousand cars and the concern that this is arbitrary. Um, this number wasn't actually arbitrary. Um, I came up with this number based upon the traffic flow numbers that Councillor Tabor had requested. Um, he asked what was the traffic flow on these streets, and they were just over 2,000 cars per day. So we knew we were getting complaints at 2,000 plus cars per day. So then I said, well, then let's half that number. Let's get to 1,000. And anything below 1,000, we're probably not going to get complaints on. You know, it's because these are high flow traffic areas that we receive the complaints. So if there's concern around that number, that's that's where it came from. Thank you for that clarification, Councillor Cook. Councillor Bagley, anything else? No? No, I agree with Councillor Cook. I yeah. guess when I said arbitrary earlier, what I meant is we knew the number was lower than 2,000, and we thought maybe 1,000 was a good starting place, and if somebody came by and had a 999 cars a day and we got complaints, we might have to further adjust it. But it was a... We thought a good number to okay. start with. And what does that do to Congress Street? Nothing. No. Uh, well, it allows them to apply and allows the city manager to say no um, or bring it to us. But I imagine that it will be brought to us on that. Where we will get well, to I think if, the, if I may, Your Honor, if the, the amendment passes, it says the only place you can't have it is where it reverses the travel lane. Mm -hmm. which suggests that you are allowing it yes. in other places, which right. means it's not coming to me. Val, did that, was there a second on that motion? So, um, Originally the assistant mayor. Yes, the assistant yep. mayor. Yep. Yes. I didn't did know you that. you second that yes. um, reverses? Yes. 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 Um, okay, yeah, you're right. It doesn't, okay. Um, Anything else, Councilor Tabor? I just I think we can move the question now. All right. Uh, Are we just voting on the amendment? Or we're voting on the amendment now to not the whole thing. Change the one word versus instead of one word reverses.
legal inquiry, uh, Susan, are there other places that we would be <coughs> changing this that? That you've been discussing? In order to have the, uh, uh, the intended effect of eliminate the ability to reverse travel lanes. I don't believe so. Okay. All right, uh, we'll have a roll call vote on the amendment, which is to uh, change the word um, impede to reverse. Impedes to reverse. Okay. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Passes unanimously. Next up, we have the question uh, or the amended uh, motion. Also have a roll call vote. Oh, no. sorry. Okay. Councilor Moreau. <laughs> um, I know we haven't talked a lot about the fees, and I was a. Oh, yeah, that's right. The whole, <laughs> the whole cost. The whole cost of yeah. this? Like, I thought we should discuss maybe that. We should point out that sidewalk <laughs> licenses are the only thing that are going year round, but yes. Yeah. Not the entire outdoor dining apparatus, but the sidewalk licenses. Right. So there's, well, the sidewalk is the, the first part, but then there's the loading zones and parking area fees and whatnot. And I know that I was completely against keeping the fees the same as last year. Um, I think with the thought process of that they're shortening the time frame, making it sort of in adjacent to the, the previous numbers that we've been given by the city, those numbers kind of have to be lowered. And I guess I'm, I'm more okay with the fees as they, as they lay now, especially after getting to see what people are actually paying that, that was sent to us. I think that was very helpful to know exactly what's being paid in the fees. So I am now, based off of the data that's been supplied, okay with leaving the fees as they are. And I think that um, we could reevaluate re that when the time comes once we might redo the whole area of Market Square. So I'm good for that for now. I just wanted to put that up. Thank you, uh, Council Mayor, Council Tabor. Uh, thanks, Your Honor. Uh, question for city, the city manager. We have had since 2012, I think, a sidewalk cafe ordinance, which is $10 per square foot. So uh, question for the city attorney and the city manager, would this repeal that and replace it with $500 flat fee um, or um, I, I don't understand how this plays with what we already have. Fair question. So this is a policy, a city council policy. And if the cafe, sidewalk cafe is an ordinance, um, it would, is it an ordinance or a policy? It's ordinance. A, ordinance. Um, I, I, I think, I think it's a policy. I'm going to pull it up policy. right now. I'm pretty sure it's a policy. Um, the deputy city manager and deputy city attorney is here, and I think she looked into this today. I think it's a policy that was adopted at the beginning of this council's term. And if that is the case, would the, the newer policy govern? Or would you have to repeal the old one to deal with the new one? I think the new one would govern, but it would be more appropriate to repeal the first to make I, it clear. And we, this would all be cleared up when we make outdoor dining and ordinance mm -hmm. in, in, in the final analysis, but um, Suzanne, do you want to just opine on that? Uh, sure. So there is some conflict between what you'll find uh, in some of the prior policies, and we are assuming that this policy will um, trump that. Now there is um, for example, uh, an opportunity for a restaurant or a table or to get like a single table and chairs and make them available to the public. Um, and that kind of stays in place because it doesn't conflict with this new policy that you're looking to adopt. Um, we also see this new policy that you're looking to adopt as not affecting our otherwise the amount that we charge for licenses for construction and for other encumbrances on the city sidewalk. So this is kind of a narrow policy just to deal with outdoor dining. It wouldn't affect um, non-dining fees and other structures. 
So we're okay with that. And, and the guidelines that were issued last year that are on the city website for 2022, we would take down and we would update though that document to be consistent with the policy guidelines set today and fill in some of the gaps in terms of insurance and those other aspects that um, we would otherwise handle kind of administratively. Thank you, Suzanne. Council Maroon. So that leads me to a follow-up question. Does that mean that then other um, establishments downtown, uh, retail shops and whatnot, they're just as able to use that sidewalk walk policy maybe that we have now that's not serving or part of the dining in order if they wanted to put out you know a rack of books or a rack of clothes or something on a nice weekend do does that policy encompass them so that they know they could actually use that um, I, I would defer to the, the two attorneys but I think as long as they're not impeding the sidewalk in the same way that the dining opportunities are not impeding the sidewalk would you both agree that there is eligible Suzanne we we have like I said a separate part of the ordinance that talks about encumbrances of sidewalks so if you want to revisit sort of those other things like for example if you want to put a planter out which is the more typical thing that happens you know there's a you pay a fee and you get the encumbrance for that um, and I can uh, I'm trying to think you go through the city clerk's office and you well maybe it's online now um, and you fill out the form and I forget it's like a small nominal fee for the whole season um, if you want to expand it to retail I guess I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity to do it right and make sure you know we could bring back something maybe next uh, at the next meeting to to cover other uses other than outdoor dining because you got to be careful you know about what it is that they want to put out and where mm -hmm. so okay but if it's um so the system error was kind of have to pull up the policy uh it's it states tables chairs a phrase a frame uh signs yeah. so we might have to update that to include things that would be um not obstructive of the the uh, the traveling or General not the traveling uh, uh, the sidewalk but you know I won't get any businesses in trouble that have already been taking advantage of this but definitely have walked by some racks of clothes as I've walked downtown um, so it would be good to immortalize that and bring vibrancy um, there uh, if we can Councilor Boyle thank you Honor. Um, and just looking at the dining on the sidewalk portion of this um, and the fees and opening up to year round um, I'm a little concerned about what we're opening up here. Um, under this, you'd be able to get your sidewalk for $300 for all the whole year if you composted. Um, I know that's, you know, I mean, we have to treat everyone equally. We have to treat if you're, on, if you're right in Market Square or if you're on the, you know, the edge of town. Um, but I'm concerned that that means we're giving away most of Market Square for $300 for the whole year. Um, I, I just... I don't think that would warrant any investment. You know what I mean? Like I would, any business owner would be like, yeah, I don't even have to think about that. Of course I'm gonna do that. And I'll, maybe I'll staff it, you know, maybe I'll use it. Um, you know, I don't really think, I think, I would think more of a fee of, you know, the five square feet like is on the, um, on the, on the um, parking spaces would, would be applicable here with maybe a minimum of $500. Um, but I wanted to kind of get the council's temperature on how they felt about this year round and that flat fee of 500. All right, Assistant Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, to touch on that, um, Councilor Blaylock, again, going back to kind of the, the policies that we use with the side sidewalk obstruction, um, you have to remove during snow, you, you can't, um, you can't, um, during snow removal, it has to be removed. You can't, um, during, during city projects. Uh, so we already, with the sidewalk obstruction permit, it is it is yearly. You can still put your A-frames out. You could still put your your tables out in the winter. You'd have to remove them when there's when there's snow clearing and th and things like that. So again, I think it in lines with the with the policy we've we've already had when you pay for those type of sidewalk obstructions. We're talking about outdoor dining, right? Because there's a difference between like where you can serve liquor and there's just like a sidewalk obstruction, like a table that anyone can use. There's two different. 
um, applicant. Like those are two different permits, right? Right. Right, and that's a good distinction. So like the the. So I'm talking about outdoor yeah. dining, you know, there's I, liquor and. Yep. You know. So the yeah. dining on city sidewalks is separate from the uh, the license yes. and the citizen. So um, may it might uh, it might make sense to since we already have a. I guess I just worry about having confusion and competing uh, policies when it comes to the dining city sidewalk, but maybe Councilor Cook's going to absolve me of any confusion. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the goal with changing the fee was to encourage more outdoor dining, to encourage restaurants to continue to, to, to have outdoor dining, to make sure we increase vibrancy. Um, when I think about sidewalks downtown, I don't think about giving away our sidewalks for restaurants and cafes. I think restaurants and cafes create vibrancy in downtown and benefit our residents as much as they benefit our business owners. So I think we're, I'm trying to shift the conversation away from we're giving you something to you're creating a vibrant downtown where everyone wants to be. And that business makes it more pleasant to be downtown. People are excited about being downtown. That's why we receive so many emails from residents who want to be downtown in one outdoor dining. So essentially this changes that fee structure and encourages restaurants to have outdoor tables and outdoor dining that have the sidewalk availability. But it still leaves in place all the discretion of the city manager and of the health inspector to determine if it's impeding too much of the sidewalk to allow for enough traffic flow and pedestrian flow. So it doesn't change that um, part of the way that we administer the sidewalks in downtown. Thank you, Councillor Cook. I think that we all uh, want to see a, a vibrancy and many people, you know, still pretty vibrant out there right now, um, you know, in the middle of middle of winter we finally got some snow I think you know the details of this is you know they're all uh, important because somebody's vibrancy might be somebody else's loss and trying to align those competing priorities is is our goal by talking about the minutia of this as as much as uh, we have my question for the city manager or the city um, attorney would be around the liquor licenses and dining on the city sidewalks are restaurants able to serve through dining on city sidewalks without enclosing the um without enclosing the uh uh the area of which liquor is served the answer to that is no okay so um this is dining on city sidewalks with uh exclusive dining on city sidewalks and so Correct, because it would be enclosed? That's right. So it would be, so where this is tricky for me is that it's an exclusive dining on city sidewalks versus the city permit where it puts out tables and chairs and allows people and to take food from that as a to-go portion and eat that outside. So that's the, that's the difference in, in what this is. I certainly understand the vibrancy of of encouraging people to offer tables and chairs out, you know, out in front, but part of that vibrancy and the low cost of that would be to allow people of all walks, whether or not you purchase food there or you're taking your mows uh, down there to sit and eat there, versus what I think would necessitate a higher fee for exclusivity of that that area. Mm -hmm. Councilor Cook, uh, thank you. Um, I would say that. Currently, the way that it's set up, the, the <laughs> tables and chairs that are set up that are not for dining with a liquor license would still be, in many cases, besides right in the middle of Market Square, an inappropriate place for somebody to buy something from another location as takeout and sit down in front of, say, Sears Street Bakery or sit down on Cup of Joe's tables sitting outside of there to sit down and eat something that they took out from another restaurant. That is those those restaurants are paying for those sidewalk tables there's only one location where we have tables and chairs that are kind of considered public use beyond the the specifically designed kind of picnic tables that the city places out for public use so and that is right in the middle of market square beyond that 
all the tables and chairs are really for the establishments that place them outside. So, so I don't feel like this is really a difference. Councilor Boyock. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I'll just say as a restaurant owner, and, um, and I'm very familiar with this, you know, being downtown for so long, um, you know, we're coming up on 50 years of our family restaurant. Um, when you do this, you have a waiter, there's a section, it belongs to that restaurant now. Those tables get waited on, that waiter's going to go tell if someone else sits there with their mows to go leave. They're going to say, no, 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 this is part of our, we paid for this, you know, this is part of our restaurant. This is our, our front room, essentially. Um, the chairs and tables that everyone is so fond of and everyone always speaks of that used to be in front of Breaking New Grounds, in front of Cafe Brioche, those were not, did not have waiters. Everyone loved them because they were free. You could get every Mo's. Dagan could have his coffee. We could sit together. You know, that it was, it was, there was no rules. It was, everyone was welcome. Um, so to me, there's very different rules. It's very different whether you get a waiter coming over with table service and everything, or it's a table and a chair that's taking up a little space on a sidewalk that anyone can use if they would like. And, and yes, if it's out front of Sears Street Bakery, it is probably going to be used mostly by Sears Street Bakery patrons. Um, however, you know, one person might get their sandwich from Sears Street, one person might get their series from, or sandwich from Moe's, and they can sit there. If under this, they have had a waiter and it was under, you know, behind a barrier, they could not do that. You know, it, 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 it the, well, the waiter would get very mad because they'd be like, well, you're not going to order our food, you know, I'm losing my tips, what am I doing here? Um, so you create a whole nother, so to me it's very, very different. Um, it's either part of the restaurant or it just happens to be a table near the restaurant. Um. Any, from this side and then we'll come back. Councilor Cook, Councilor Tabor. Uh, thanks, Your Honor. Uh, as I understand it, the goal here is to lower the cost of using the sidewalk. Why can't we just lower the cost of the sidewalk cafe ordinance that we already have. Um, you know, we've got something that's been in place for 12 years. I personally have heard no complaints from restaurant owners about using it. It has a substantial body of, of um, protections in it for pedestrians to walk past these exclusive areas and still use the sidewalk. Um, and it, you know, it's, if we want to just lower the price, let's lower the price of the ordinance we already have in place. So I would suggest um, that as an amendment to Councilor Bagley and Cook. Councilor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. And, um, you know, I, I think Councilor Blaylock brings up a pretty good point because the, the tables in Market Square um, in particular I think uh, the residents really feel that they have, you know, those are their tables and for a long time there's been a lot of sharing. So perhaps an amendment could be um, this policy would be available with the exception of Market Square or I'd be happy to go back to the previous policy. Mr. Mayor, um, Deputy City Manager Woodland um, might have a point of order here. It, it references using the type of license we would use for okay. this. Go ahead, Suzanne. Sure. So the license that we've used for the last three years now under COVID, um, it is going to be the same structure. So it's going to have all of those same bells and whistles that we've been doing for the last three years. You're just setting the policy by which we're going to administer the current <coughs> license structure. So I don't that's the whole point of kind of like paragraph five, which is we're going to meld the policy into the existing cafe licensing structure. You're just setting the fees and then providing that additional guidance on where. Um, so that that is still that whole framework that people have been using is going to continue to exist um, with all those protections in terms of making sure that we have insurance that there's enough room for the public way to travel, you know, the sidewalks um, and all of those pieces. So it's just gonna get merged into or updated. Um, and then it is under, if you go under like the city clerk's website, you'll see there's a, um, 
the application as the assistant mayor was talking about for sidewalk obstruction licenses. We weren't anticipating changing that. It covers the A-phrase and signs. It covers the miscellaneous things that retailers sometimes want to put out on the sidewalk. And, and that process is not envisioned to change. Now, some people like what used to happen in front of, well, Cafe Brioche, then breaking the grounds and then popovers and um, all of those iterations um, in front of Market Square. Those were always tables that had to be pursuant to the requirements of the city of Portsmouth through the sidewalk obstruction license open to the public. They didn't have a choice. If you were to go through this format of the sidewalk obstruction license, you're paying just for the table, just for the chair. There was a fee and it had to be open to the public. Um, and that was just a special requirement and that, that exists. Um, and then there is another section, if you look under like chapter nine, I just had it up and closed out. Um, yeah, chapter nine, which talks about obstructions and licenses. Um, that's the structure that allows the city council, which gets implemented by the city manager to issue these licenses and permits and other pieces that some of which we bring to you, such as when we have that construction license for, you know, a year to to facilitate the building, uh, uh, you know, a renovation of a building, or the small encumbrance permits that we do for 30 days for people to just put up some scaffolding to paint a wall for two weeks. So there are these other structures in place, but I want to be clear that we're anticipating that this policy is simply going to be folded into the existing licensing process that we've been using fairly successfully over the last three years. So I hope that helps. Suzanne, it might be helpful to just know where this policy differs from the existing policy and why we need the, the new policy. Like it's, sim it's simply because the guidelines that were in last year that, that you can, you know, click on and, and see that, you know, it set a fee um, and we were having, remember, the city the staff was asking not to have um, uh, 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 outdoor dining in the travel lanes. Um, so really what you needed to do is is update it because that is not traditionally until COVID been something that was allowed. No, I'm just saying like we have a we have a city, we have a sidewalk obstruction permit process right now. You said nothing is going to change. So I'm curious why we have to change anything in order to get what we're going to. Maybe I'm not following that point. No. Councilor Cook. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, what it changes is it provides a flat fee as an alternate fee structure versus paying per square footage. Um, so it's an alternate, you know, $500, or if it's less expensive to do what you've been doing through our existing structure, you can. Um, and then it requires um, additional conditions around what your barriers look like. And that, that came out of recommendations from the, the planning doc department report. Um, so those are the recommend, that's, that's really what this does, is it adds that layer for sidewalk dining. Okay, what are the current fees on this? Uh, $75 at a table and $10 a chair. You're on a, a point of, of references for the, the sidewalk uh, obstruction, you cannot serve alcohol and you cannot serve alcohol. So so like the, the tables- the How did we get around that last year? No, well, you, we didn't. So so if you take, for example, Elephantine, my neighbor or myself, the, the, the tables in the alleyway, you cannot, we could not serve alcohol in them. Only ones that were cordoned off and roped off can serve alcohol. So I think that's where this is getting conflated is that if you are, you, you can't have alcohol, you can't, consume alcohol in a non barricaded or fenced in right. um, location. Okay. So wouldn't it just be, I guess it's, I think we it, should just leave it alone. I think we just leave that part alone. What are we going to gain by, by adding, we're going to lower the potentially lower the price, but maybe not if they only want uh, two tables or three tables or four tables, then it's, they have the other, option it's so the, the the price is there but it's kind of squishy the other thing is requiring a divider how do we 
how do we, can we, do all they have to do is add a divider and they can serve booze in the sidewalk? Is that something that we know from the state? That also has to go before the liquor mm -hmm. review okay. committee internally and with approval from the state. Okay. So essentially what the system mayor says is if you don't intend to serve alcohol, you're only getting the traditional sidewalk cafe permit, that will stay the same. This applies to dining with alcohol. Okay. Could we change it to, to specifically state dining with alcohol and then it's just it's just rules about the um it's just we want to guess put uh what they have to um put there but okay uh, councilor cook uh mayor it doesn't just apply there it so it's specifically under additional condition says establishments requiring a divider between dining area and sidewalk. So that specifies that those establishments that require a divider, that this is what we want your divider to look like. It doesn't say establishments that don't have a divider or are not required to have a divider now need to have a divider. So it, 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 it's just basically saying this is what your divider should look like if you're required to have a divider. Um, and that you should have, you should remove tables and chairs so to avoid interference with snow removal activities or other municipal needs. That's, that's all we're saying here because once you make it year round, you wanna make sure people are not leaving their tables and chairs on the sidewalk if there's snow removal. So that's, that's essentially what this is doing. That's why we have um, the section here specifically on city sidewalks is make it year round, give them the option of a flat fee, which is probably less than what they're paying in some circumstances. In some circumstances, it's less to follow the current ordinance, which will still remain in place. Um, to allow abutters beyond the establishment, the permission to, to, um, to ask the abutters, essentially for permission, if you want sidewalk dining beyond the scope of your abutment on your establishment. Mm -hmm. And to, um, I guess, normalize the dividers across the city so that they're all similar in nature. Your and I think, oh, if you don't, for a point of clarification, because um, I think, you know, we're kind of getting in the weeds of it. A, a location like Raleigh Wine Bar, a, a location like Popovers, um, get yeah, Popovers, where they're fenced in. Yep. So they, they have traditionally, because they've served alcohol and want an exclusivity to their tables for their business, um, I think that's where, versus Again, a place like Cup of Joe where people plenty of times will get a sandwich sure. from Elephantine and a coffee from us and, and sit at our table. So we leave them open to the public, not roped off. So I think that is where the, the difference the difference is where some confusion is stemming from. Yeah, and my I guess my confusion around this or does like having two policies that that govern potentially the same thing and potentially different things is hard to imagine. Like we have the policy for sidewalks that do not want to serve liquor, do not have to put up ropes mm -hmm. that exists currently today. And we have another policy that could apply to those people, but could also apply to liquor. So it would be helpful if we could figure out dining on city sidewalks to be specific to serving alcohol and exclusivity. Yep. Your Honor, I think Suzanne wants to make a point here. Suzanne? I mean, certainly we can, we, if, if we need more sorting out, I, we have time. We could bring this back for the next meeting with some more, you know, try and clarify this. But right now you have to understand that if you want to have tables and chairs in a parking space or in a travel way, you must have this policy in place for the city to continue to provide that space for outdoor dining because until COVID, we did not allow our parking spaces and our travel ways and anything other than really the sidewalk to have outdoor dining. So you can have outdoor dining with or without alcohol in a parking space in a travel way under this policy. And that's really what the city council has been doing every year since COVID, which is establishing a policy that is really taking uh, a more invested interest, if you will, in, in opening up outdoor dining. So, so that's why you do need some kind of policy. And I think Councilor Cook did a nice job elaborating the sort of the differences um, and and I, from I, what happened last year. Suzanne, so. I, I agree with with all of that, and I would say section we work through section four. We you know 
disregarded your uh, recommendations on uh, that. Um, we, I think we're in agreement on Section 5. Uh, section, well, there might be some small things on that, but Section 2, what, what I think I'm hung up on is that we have a current policy that exists, and then we have an overlay policy that's not specific to serving alcohol and enclosing. Uh, they, they coexist, and that seems like a, a weird thing uh, for us to, to try to sort out. Councillor Bagley? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm going to desperately need a bio break, but I yep. think we should vote before we get there. Um, one thing I'll throw out is, because this has gone on for, I think, four or five meetings now, we do plan to bring forward an ordinance later on this year. So we could potentially pass this, pass this and revisit some of these intricacies that may be not as well um, defined, but then we would at least let the residents know in general what we are thinking. Right. I, I don't have a problem with doing that. What, I, what I'm trying to get is clarity. Right now, the dining on city sidewalks, which we currently have a current policy for, that this doesn't state the significant difference of this is only applies to when you serve alcohol and put up barriers around it and have exclusivity to that. Because you can have a part of the current policy right now for dining on city sidewalks is that you do not have exclusivity. A part of this is that you would have exclusivity to serve alcohol. And that's it. Councilor Cook. You uh, Mayor, this does not change anything around ability to serve alcohol. That determination is made separately entirely. So this does not change any of that. It just changes the appearance of the dividers that businesses have to put up if they have a permit to serve alcohol. Okay, but that's, that's we don't really state that until, um, Your Honor? Yep. Um, maybe we can see if we can sort this out. We've got dining on the sidewalks, which we have a, a per square foot cost right now. And that divides into with liquor, fenced off, or without liquor, small tables. And then we've got dining in loading zones, parking areas, and streets. That's paragraph two. What I hear the deputy city manager saying is, the language in one here will um, align just fine with our existing uh, sidewalk cafe policy. Um, and all it does is lower the price to a flat fee uh, and open it up to year round. Um, <clears throat> so, so on the year round, like, so the example of the Raleigh. So the Raleigh would have access to year-round dining where other establishments would not have access to year-round dining. So would popovers. So would popovers. Tuscan Market. Okay. Mm -hmm. Councilor Moreau? I have a problem with the flat fee because a lot of these places have been doing this for several years and paying the per square foot fee. And it's kind of a, a revenue to the city that I don't really want to lose. Because no one's complained about paying the per square foot. So... I think we should keep it. I like the idea of the flat fee. I'm fine with keeping it the $5 a square foot, but I think we need to keep it. I, year round, I don't care. Year round, I, I think for the city, it might be more of a problem to have some of those bigger establishments there year round. Um, I think you know places where they're having fencing and stuff out and they're gonna have to remove it every time there's a snowstorm, they're probably gonna remove it anyway. So I don't think it makes sense for them. Maybe they'll just put out a chair or two you know, year round, but bigger establishments for that. Um, so I, I have a problem with the fee, but I don't have a problem with the rest of it. Mr. Mayor, just a point of order. It seems like there's too many conflicts here and legal would be happy to, you know, examine both of these policies, the proposed policy and the existing policy and the ordinances and give you a report back. Um, to yeah, how they I think affect we, each other and, um, if one is overriding the other. Yeah, I mean, I think we gotta get through it. Like, we, we, we've we gotta get through, you know, I'm sorry, we can take a pause to use the restroom, but um, like, we have we have discussed this. Part of this, you know, the council is making sausage in public, so like, you know, there's not like conversations happening. Like, this would have gone a lot faster if 
Councilor Cook and I sat down and hashed out the, the whole plan here, but um, we have these conversations in public because that's what city councils do. They talk in public about these things. So apologies that it's taking longer. We are, uh, so Councilor Moreau has stated that she, um, the flat fee, it seems like it gives a leg up to businesses that, you know, if you're closing a travel lane um, uh, versus using sidewalks, you know, how could, how could one restaurant that's, that has, uh, let's say, what's, the, what's the, the break even, 10 tables versus 20 tables, how can they pay the same amount? That does not seem equitable for the restaurant that's paying 10 ta for 10 tables versus the one that's paying uh, 20 tables. Why would we not go back to the, the per square footage fee that seems to be, even if we were to keep it at the same rate? Mm -hmm. Councilor Cook? Um, Your Honor, that th the reason that I envisioned this as a flat fee is because that restaurant that has uh, 20 tables and a prime location is probably paying a lot more in rent for that prime location because they want the space to have 20 tables on the sidewalk. So it's, it's hard to compare apples and oranges. You know, some restaurants have better locations than others. Some are lucky enough to have great locations for sidewalk dining, and others are not. Um, all we can do is put in place a policy that encourages what we want to see downtown. And so the goal here was to encourage outdoor dining. I should note that in the policy that we've had in place for many, many years for sidewalk dining, we've only had a small number of establishments um, step forward and put in place outdoor dining. Um, COVID really drove that um, to a much larger number. But prior to COVID, we really didn't have that many under the current policy. So I was looking at that and saying, hmm, what happens in the long run post COVID? We want to keep encouraging restaurants to have outdoor dining. And so that was the goal in putting in place the flat fee. Um, I am flexible um, on adapting that if we need to. Um, but I think the really important parts of this um, dining on city sidewalk section are that we make it year round so restaurants have that discretion. Um, I can think of several restaurants that um, it would benefit them to be able to have that um, for a longer period of time than the time we're defining in loading zones. I mean, because we really limited that time and, and those on the sidewalks probably have a little more flexibility there. Um, and then also to make sure that we have consistency in the look of the barriers downtown because that came forward in that report from the, the planning department. Uh, and I think the goal around that is to make sure that there's visibility, the health inspector can inspect appropriately, and you don't create vibrancy when you create barriers to seeing the outdoor dining. So. Uh, thank you, Councilor Cook. So uh, on that, it still seems like we would be um, choosing between a restaurant that is on a sidewalk and potentially, you know, Vaughn Mall versus any other place where you're having a, a parking spot that, that seems like a, uh, a, a tough thing. And then with the year, you know, the year round seems like um, originally when I thought it was, when I first read it and I was conflating it with the sidewalk, um, the idea that we would have year round for, for gated areas seems like a lot um, to, to, to bite off if we were going to do um, year-round of any. Again, uh, because many restaurants would not have the ability to have year-round uh, through parking. Your Honor, a uh, question for city manager or uh, deputy city manager. What, for for these sectioned off um, areas, what is the current policy and end date? Or is there what? Or is that is that policy as it's, as it's written right now technically year-round and nobody nobody traditionally has done it? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Susan or Suzanne, do you know the answer to that question? Suzanne is. So, so there's the policy 2012-02, which is the policy regarding use of city property for sidewalk cafes providing alcohol service. So that was in place and a couple of uh, establishments did use that prior to COVID. It has a lot of requirements in it, um, which frankly, got kind of absorbed and adopted during COVID um, into the policy. 
and the practices that you see on the website now from last year in terms of insurance. And, and when people fill out the form online, there's lots of boxes that they check of, you know, you won't damage the sidewalk, you have to get your health insurance, your health permit and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of stuff on the back end you don't necessarily see um, unless you're filling out the form. Um, and so that policy exists. You can take a look at it if you want. Um, Does it speak to a time one, frame? Is there a timeline? To a time frame of May 1st. They have to make an application to the city council by May 1st. And the terms of this, it's called an area service agreement, would be for no more than six months. and shall typically run mid-April through mid-October. Sounds good. I, uh, yeah. Your Honor. Councilor Bagley. Could I make a motion that we adjust the time period in two, I'm sorry, in one from section A from year round to uh, May 1st through Indigenous Peoples Day? If I get a second, I'll speak to it. Second. Um, I think there is a concern um, on I some on the council that having the fence restricted dining zones year round is, is not equitable. So I think you'd be able to have the sidewalk encumbrance year round, which is the tables we traditionally think of at Market Square. But as far as corrals, which people generally would only put the fencing up if they were going to serve alcohol, because that's a state requirement. And if they're not going to serve alcohol, they probably won't put the fences up. We can make that time period match the time period of the on street and parking space dining. And I kind of want to call the question. Is there a second? Or a second. Uh, uh, okay. Councilor Cook. Um, the reason that I shifted this to your round is because is when I have traveled to other places, the thing that I love the most is that there is outdoor dining in November. There's outdoor dining in December in Munich. There's outdoor dining year round all around the world in very vibrant cities. And so what I'm saying here is that we need to be thinking about the long term when we have expanded sidewalks throughout the city, encouraging outdoor dining rather than limiting it. And by changing it to May 1st through Indigenous Peoples Day, we're actually shifting the current um, uh, ability. Like right now, they can do they do mid-April to really later. Um, in fact, some of them go through mid-November. Um, it's about six months, but not really six months. So what we're saying is, is we're going to limit you even further than you're currently allowed. I don't think we're limiting. It seems like we, we took the policy from Suzanne and we're simply continuing the current policy that we have. As it's currently stated in the, in the, this, this sidewalk. It's currently stated at si up to this or six months. So if we, if we stick with the six month window. Councilor Bagley. I'll, I'll just point out that this would go into effect this spring. The council plans to bring this back as an ordinance during the summer, and we can fine tune these details before we get to the end date of the dining. Sounds good. Um, Councilor Blaylock. Thank you. I was just going to say, um, I think I want to thank Councilor Bagley for bringing this up. I think it's the, the barriers that everyone's worried about having those obstructions there all year. That's what I'm worried about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Councilor Cook. Um, I want to get a, an opinion from Suzanne Woodland, if I can, uh, on, because this applies to all sidewalk dining. So if we start limiting it, then all of a sudden people, um, my concern is people won't be able to put their cafe tables and chairs out either. In the well, middle. The but we're currently, in, it's the, the limit was from the, the current sidewalk right. use plan. She was reading from the 2012 I, policy. I, wanna, I just want to make sure that that is the case, because I've seen uh, restaurants who put out their tables and chairs on a nice day in February. So I want to double check that we're not limiting those who ex can currently Jason. just rent table and chairs. Jason moves a little slower on nice days in February. He's our code enforcer. So. <laughs> it, it does limit. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yep. Yeah. Okay, but it's currently limited. Yeah, it is. No, it paragraph is four. It's fair to say that during COVID there were there was relaxation of the policy to support restaurants. I think if you're thinking in the in the immediate past, but right, but the, the, the terms were as Suzanne had read. Councilor Murrow. 
I would really like to take advantage of the fact that we do have all of these separate policies of having legal really look at all of them and synthesize into one policy everything that we're talking about versus having to say, okay, but it's, it agrees with that, it agrees with that. I, I just, I have, yeah, I just really think we need to probably hold off on a vote on this until our next meeting and really make sure that we have our eggs straight as far as all our policies go and make sure we know whether or not it's on sidewalk, with alcohol, without. I just wanna make sure that we have a, that straight before we head into it. And as Suzanne said, we do have time. No one's gonna be putting in applications in January. Um, so if we make a vote on this in February, then we could make sure that we have the policy straight as far as I'll all our policies that together. So <laughs> there was a motion to uh, table to uh, the following uh, meeting. My concern on that is that um, I think we have some discussion around the uh, the sidewalk licenses and figuring that out. I don't know if we need to table that in order to do that, but we have some other things like travel lane, parking spots, businesses have to sort of get going on that and where we have agreement on this. I, I would like to, uh, if Vote we on table one section one, yep. because we already have a policy that deals with that yep. seemingly all the way and we could come back with section one at the following meeting and pass the other sections as long as we can get through those, I would be supportive I, of that. I, I would make a motion to do that, to just table section one to the next okay, meeting. Okay, so we'll second that. We already have one motion on the floor. No, we do okay. have a motion on the table. A, a motion to table no. supersedes. Okay. Supersedes that, but because that's it's not part exactly, of that. But tabling one section is not exactly a table. I, I would rescind my motion. Okay. I don't remember Councilor who seconded Cook. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just want a legal opinion. Can we table just one section of no, a policy can't. that we're adopting? We'd have to amend to remove section one. Yes, I think you would have to move to amend it. Yes. Yep. You should table the entire policy to the next meeting to address those issues. Or can you can you just remove section one and with the intent to bring it back and, and right. pass the rest of the policy? Right. Yep. We, we could. Can. I'd wait a motion to remove section one. Because it's currently handled by policy and administrative. With the intent so move back. Second. Second. Oh, I can't make them. Yeah. But, yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> Council Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Some of it is not actually current, currently handled, so we need to be aware of that. That some of the provisions here are not currently in the policy. Right. And, and so it does need to come back. And we'd come right. back to the next meeting as updates the current sidewalk cafe license. Okay. Yes. I now that we're. That's good. I like that. Okay. So all in favor of. Removing section one from the current or the, the policy that's before us. The intent to bring it back. With the intent, the intent to bring it back at the following meeting. Uh, aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Nay. Specifically at the next meeting. Okay. Now, are there other questions and concerns as we go through sections two through six? Two through five. Two through five. five. <laughs> oh, I think we're good now. Okay. Any further discussion before I call roll call vote on the uh, as the policy as amended? No. Nope. Uh, Val, could you take a roll call vote as the policy is amended? Gladly. <laughs> Assistant Mayor Kelly. Yes. Councilor Tabor. Yes. Councilor Denton. Yes. Councilor Moreau. Yes. Councilor Bagley. Yes. Councilor Lombardi. Yes. Councilor Blaylock. Yes. Councilor Cook. Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Passes 9 0. All right, going to take a 15 minute recess. Thank you. Go back and Well. <laughs>
Ooh. Oh, wait, we're done with that, right? Welcome back. Um, Your Honor. I motion to suspend the rules to bring forward item number 11A2, which is the proposed MOA for Portsmouth School District Paraeducators and Portsmouth Police Civilian Employees Association. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Your Honor, if I may, the, uh, the item under number two speaks is a similar request for two different groups. The first group being paraeducators and the second group being police dispatchers. Uh, this is in direct response to having great difficulty in filling positions on, and on both fronts. And to date, I believe there's still 12 open paraeducator positions. And of the 10 dispatchers that we need to have to fully staff our dispatch, we have two full timers. And I have um, the pleasure of uh, being joined by Deputy Police Chief Mike Maloney, and he can correct me if I'm wrong. But the idea is that um, in order to provide an incentive to be able to re recruit for these positions, uh, the request is to add a 4% salary adjustment, which would be in line with what the, um, all the other city employees uh, enjoyed in this fiscal year. This would be retro to January 1st of this year. And in both cases, the cost would be absorbed by existing budgets due to staffing uh, salary uh, savings. Your Honor, I motion to approve the proposed agreements as presented. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thanks for sticking around. <laughs> Chief. <laughs> okay. Good evening. Yeah. I did say right thank now. you. All right, so we'll go back to the um, the budget or the, um, the ordinance. Now, if you were just tuning in and, and at 9:45, you saw us making it to section 10 public hearings, first reading of ordinance. You would have some questions, but we handled some other business. Uh, but we have the first reading of ordinance amending chapter one. Article 17, Section 1.1705, Public Art Funds. Uh, I'd wait a sample motion to pass first reading and schedule a second reading in public hearing at the February 6, 2023 City Council meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next up is the uh, public hearing second reading of ordinance uh, and this is uh, amending chapter 7 uh, article uh, 4a section 7a.408 taxi stands uh, designated that's what we call it all right and there's a is there a presentation here your honor uh, parking director Ben Fletcher is on zoom he's just going to make a very brief set of remarks and um, if I might allow him to be brought forward Take it away, Parking Director Ben Fletcher. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Good evening, well, Ben. Yep. Uh, all right. So this one's pretty simple. Um, we had five taxi stands throughout the city, and we only have one medallion holder. So we asked that medallion holder where they thought the best taxi stand that for their business would be. And as you look at the map there, uh, the four red ones are um, to be... Um, Eliminated, and the one with the circle around it is the one that's going to be kept. Easy. Straightforward enough. Thank you, Parking Director Fletcher. Um, any questions of the council? No questions. Putting force parking spaces back on. Seems good. All right. Um, is there a, any public hearing speakers on Zoom? Because there's nobody in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> we are now alone. All right. I will close the public hearing. Any additional um, council questions? Okay. Um, I will just put this out. This would be a place where, uh, given um, we didn't see any uh, pushback, we're getting four uh, spaces. Um, we have the blessing of the one medallion holder of uh, the city of Portsmouth. This is something that after we pass provided second reading uh, would pass, we could await a motion to uh, suspend the rules and bring forth third and final reading of this ordinance uh, tonight. So moved. 
No, we still have to, so we have to move to pass, I had await a motion to pass second reading and schedule a third and final reading at the February 6, 2023 Council meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Your Honor, oh, I'd make a motion to suspend the rules and bring up uh, third and final reading. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. The ordinance passes four spots as soon as the signage can be changed. All right. Uh, and we have third and final reading uh, of the ordinance amending chapter one, article four, section 1.406, cable television and communications commissions to be named cable and broadband internet commission. I would await a motion to pass third and final reading of ordinance as presented. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Your Honor. I would just like to thank the commissioners who came out today um, in their desire to, as, as they mentioned, you know, um, internet and cell service is no longer what I would consider a luxury and, uh, you know, to improve that for our residents is, is, is great. And so I would like to, you know, just publicly thank the commissioners for bringing this forward. I would uh, heartily endorse that and look forward to um, having a place to you know, forward some of those emails of people, you know, asking, you know, why does my cell service suck um, in the city limits? Um, you know, not a magic bullet, but I think being able to advocate um, and certainly um, as there are, you know, as the, uh, the assistant mayor alluded to uh, issues when it comes, you know, this is a, a standard and a need to have. Um, so pushing for high speed Internet access everywhere um, at an affordable uh, price, you know, uh, encouraging competition um, is something that I hope to see uh, the newly formed and named um, Cable and Broadband Internet Commission do. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None opposed. City Manager. Great. Thank you. Your Honor, first up, item number one is the uh, request for approval of a proposed memorandum of agreement for the Portsmouth School Custodial Supervisors. This is an adjustment that would support their request for a new floor of COLA of 3% effective this coming July 1, 2023. Essentially, this allows us to bring these folks in line. These were, uh, this was among the first collective bargaining agreement approved, and then shortly thereafter, um, other groups were brought along with a floor of 3%. The total cost to this request is just over $1,800, and um, this was approved by the school board. I'd wait a motion to approve the proposed agreement as presented. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Great. Uh, number three would involve the request for approval of collective bargaining agreement, which would be uh, number eight if you're keeping track. This is with uh, local 1386B, primarily made up of library employees and clerks. This would be retroactive to July 1st, 2022, and would bring this collective bargaining unit in line with the other seven previously uh, approved collective bargaining agreements. Uh, next up for coming attractions will be school cafeteria employees. All right, I'd wait uh, a motion to approve the proposed agreement as presented. So moved. moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? In a post. Thank you very much, Kelly Harper and Tom Clausen, for hanging in there. We, you, you, you are free to go. Uh, <laughs> next up, number four would be uh, relative to drainage and water services access easements for property located at 1169 and 1171 Sagamore. As part of the vote taken by the planning board, the planning board recommend uh, as part of uh, granting a wetlands conditional use permit. The planning board recommend that, that the city grant a drainage easement to the property owners accept a drainage easement and an access easement for water services from the property owners. So um, the memo is fairly self-explanatory. I'm happy to, to save you the reading verbatim, but essentially what's currently there on these two lots are three existing single family homes and the end result will be eight new structures with a total of 10 units. So happy to answer any questions. Your Honor, I read, uh, move that we uh, authorize the city manager to accept and record a draining easement and an access easement for water services from Sagamore Group LLC and to grant a drainage easement to Sagamore Group LLC. Second. Any discussion? Questions? 
Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Item number five is a public access easement for 238 Deer Street. This property has received planning board approval and in addition to site plan approval from the planning board, the project received a conditional use permit and a variance for open space from the Board of Adjustment. And the approved site plan includes a pedestrian access easement to be conveyed from the owner to the city. This easement for public access presented to council for approval about an existing public access agreement located at 46 Maplewood Ave, accepted and approved by council back in 2019. This easement was recommended by TAC in order to create a wider public access easement between the two. Makes it more inviting. The total easement area is 390 square feet in your plan. I'd make a motion that we vote to Second. accept the Long Meadow, uh, no, sorry, wrong one. Accept the easement as presented. <laughs> uh, move to grant authority. Uh, I'd wait a motion grant. to grant authority for the city manager to nego negotiate, execute, accept, and record the easement for public access in a form similar to the attached. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> Thank you. Number six is a request for formal acceptance of Long Meadow Road property located at Long Meadow Road. This is uh, a project that was <coughs> approved uh, with the city accepted property from Service Credit Union back in 2019 as part of a subdivision in order for the city to construct an extension of Long Meadow Road. And since that time, many of you have driven on this road. The city has completed construction of the extension, which was designed pursuant to a traffic study in order to divert traffic from the intersection of Lang Road and Lafayette Road to the intersection of Long Meadow Road, Ocean Road, and Lafayette Road, where there's the existing traffic signal. And although the city accepted the property, we have not formally accepted the roadway and we would ask that the city um, accept Long Meadow Road as a city street. We wait a motion to accept Long Meadow Road as a city street. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Number seven similarly is a request for acceptance of Hodgton Way as a city street. This project was completed as part of a the land uh, master assembly of, of properties. During the project, the city built a new roadway to traverse through the West End Yards development along the bank of Hodgton Brook to create a link between Kate Street and the Route 1 bypass. And as you all know, this new roadway segment now gives Islington Street and Bartlett Street area traffic direct access to Route 1 bypass. Although the city owns the property, it's best practice for the city council to formally vote to accept this as a city street. I'd wait a motion to accept Hodgson Way as a city street. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Last up, number eight is a request for Eastman's for property located at 951 Peverly Hill Road and 1400 Lafayette Road. Back in 2020, the planning board granted site plan review approval for the construction of a 53 unit garden and townhouse style residential development and has since been extended twice. Uh, due to initially to COVID and due to the change in ownership. And as part of the approval process, the planning board recommended that the city accept community space easements, a sidewalk easement, and an access easement for water services. What I can tell you is um, in your packet, at least in mine, they're, in, uh, they're not in the order that I just read them, and two of them have the former city manager's name in them. Those will be corrected. Those uh, will not be, uh, those, are, those I would consider in the category of the minor edits to the documents. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we are looking for the um, approval f to finalize it and accept and record these easements. I'd wait a motion to authorize the city manager to finalize, accept and record community space easements, a sidewalk easement, and access easement for water services from Four Amigos LLC and Yokin, Yokin's Townhomes LLC. So moved. moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Next up, our consent agenda. I'd wait a motion to adopt the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Um, next up, email correspondence. I'd wait a motion to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next up, a uh, letter from Barbara McMillan, Chair of the Conservation Commission, requesting City Council support for review and proposed revisions to Article 10 
environmental protection standards of the zoning ordinance. <coughs> so moved. I'd I'll wait make. a motion to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. Um, I need Your Honor, if I might make a point here. I know that the intent of the Conservation Commission was to, to garner or solicit general support for, for any changes that they develop, and they would, um, they would meet jointly with the Planning Board and then bring back to the Council for a ref referral to the Land Use Committee. I think they just want sort of t tacit understanding that they'll be working on things that would come back to you for approval, but I see um, Councillor Moreau may want to add to that. Well, Councillor Denton had the floor, or yeah. and then right. Councillor Moreau. Well, I want to first thank the Conservation Commission for bringing this forward. I believe the last revision was done in the 2016-17 Council, because remember working on that, and also thank the uh, Deputy City Manager slash Attorney for explaining to me what you just explained to the entire Council, which essentially be they're just letting us know they're going to be working with the Planning Department. And then from there, they'll bring it back to us to either send to Council Moreau's Land Use Planning Board or send to legal. So it's the beginning of a process. Um, yeah, I was just going to make the suggestion that they should work with the Planning Board because the Planning Board wants to work on the Wetland Conditional Use Permit. And I think that it would be a good time to bring up all of those things together. So I think as a in connection, I think they should have a work session between Conservation Commission and um, that and deal with all of the issues that both Planning Board and they want to look at all at the same time would be yep. my suggestion. And just to drive home the point when it says requesting the City Council support for review and proposed revisions to Article 10, those revisions are not yet here. Right. We do not know what they are, uh, but we do give our full support for them going out and uh, making proposed revisions uh, with the Planning Board and bringing those recommendations. Uh, to uh, back to City Council and we're very excited that they are doing that work and uh, again thank for all the work that the Conservation Commission uh, does on behalf of the citizens of Portsmouth. So um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right um, I have a few appointments uh, to uh, consider. First um, I'd like you to consider Anna Howard to the Economic Development Commission as an alternate. Um, and then the appointment of Ann Hayes to the COVID Response Task Force Blue Ribbon Committee. Um, those do not have to be uh, voted on. Um, I do uh, request a, um, a vote on the appointment of City Manager Karen Connard uh, as the Portsmouth representative of the Peace Development Authority Board of Directors. Um, I guess, do, do I need a, a motion? Move I would move that we, uh, the council approve the appointment of City Manager Karen Connard as the Portsmouth representative to the Pease Development Authority. Second. And I would uh, simply like to, to thank Eric Anderson uh, for the work that he has done, diligent work uh, over the last um, three years. Um, I have always been impressed uh, with not only the effort uh, but acumen that he brought uh, to the role um, and I thank him for the service that he's given to the City of Portsmouth. Uh, I am excited to uh, appoint um, Karen um, as our city manager uh, dealing with the PDA uh, and being able to bring the full weight of City Hall uh, to that board. I believe that it is, um, it is in the city's uh, best interest to have her expertise, uh, her staff supporting that, and also our direct oversight in terms of um, our, uh, uh, you know, we can only tell, uh, we can only direct one person uh, in the whole city of Portsmouth, um, and, and that's Karen. So I do believe that it further empowers the council uh, to be empowered on the PDA. So I look forward to the work that you're going to bring to that um, and the effort of staff to support you in that. Councilor Denton. In addition to that, this gives the city council um, more, I want to say power, but when it comes to offshore wind, some things will likely go in front of the PDA over the coming years. And I'm excited to have you at the table. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Um, next up was update on the sound barriers. Um, you know, if, uh, sometimes uh, it's important to get information out there. Um, I saw um, folks uh, bringing this up, and I wanted to uh, let everybody know that we've reached out uh, to the state. Uh, we're expecting uh, them to advertise this uh, June. Uh, inside tracks probably August, October um, uh, to go to construction uh, in the following year. I know a lot of folks have been, uh, you know, working on this for many number of years, uh, going back to, you know, uh, 
certainly Manny, uh, uh, but uh, Representative Somsich and uh, Panalakis, uh, the, the list goes on and on in terms of tier two. Uh, and what kind of broke the, the log jam is the state decided they were gonna do work on that overpass um, and took the opportunity um, to push these as, uh, as tier uh, one. I know that there was a lot of executive council meetings. Uh, this is on the state website. Um, so pretty clear information on that. I've requested um, Karen, um, the city manager, that we bring that. Um, we make a sound barriers um, website as a, a part of the city of Portsmouth website, link out to relevant documents. So homeowners um, in the affected communities uh, that will be getting sound barriers can be updated on that and to know that this is, you know, it is distinctly a priority. Um, and then that would also be a good place for us to house any information on additional uh, sound barriers that we might pursue on Portsmouth property. And I want to again take the opportunity to state that we are not allowed to use, even though we asked uh, to uh, and try to use Portsmouth funds. Uh, to support the extension of state mandated uh, uh, sound barriers through their federally approved policy. You know, we throw, we've, we've said equity a number of times, but the feds are directly, they don't want communities to use their money to support sound barriers that don't fall into a policy uh, because then a state would simply make a really restrictive policy and let the rich communities use all their money on that and, uh, and otherwise um, you know, uh, less fortunate communities would not have that opportunity. So they're very clear. We can't build anything in the, uh, the right of way of the state, uh, but this is happening. The funds are there. It's on the 10 year plan. Money is being spent um, you know, in preliminary designs. Um, this will be advertised uh, this year with construction uh, starting uh, in the following year. Any questions on that for either me or I'd probably uh, punt to the city manager. Anything you'd like to add, Karen, that I didn't touch on? No, I think that's great. We will, in similar fashion to other project pages on our website, we will stand up the material that we have and share links to the New Hampshire DOT page so people can track the progress that we've been tracking. Uh, next was an update on the Sherburne School neighborhood meeting. I know that there was a, uh, a lot of uh, desire around this. I know Councilor Blaylock uh, specifically uh, uh, asked me, he's been having his own meetings, uh, being the fact that he would live across the street from the, uh, the project. Um, but this is really an opportunity to listen to uh, the community. It will be more of a dialogue um, and, and not as stuffy uh, work session, so we'll be able to answer um, as many questions uh, as we can. Um, again, coming to the site, that is, January 31st, I think it's a Tuesday, if memory serves. Um, it's at 6 p.m. It's in the Sherburne building, and I want to assure that, um, you know, I believe that, that, that housing is a, is a crisis that permeates everything that we do here. Um, we're coming to listen to you um, in the neighborhood. Um, I believe that there can be a project that we can agree that is a great benefit to the city of Portsmouth but also strengthens the community that already exists there. Um, and it's our, uh, our sincere hope and my sincere hope to listen uh, and to focus the conversation on what people um, are concerned about, bring all of those concerns. Um, but I would, I would simply ask to bring an open mind um, as well as you've done um, at our first meeting uh, to continue the conversation. How do we make you know, Portsmouth character stronger and that's always our people. Um, how do we make that a stronger community uh, this is one step uh, in that process. Another point and clarification. Um, I assume, but, but just to clarify for the public at home, the PHA will be in attendance. Correct. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We're going to drag Craig there. Um, you know, and 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 Craig. Um, you know, he mentioned uh, to me uh, when I, I spoke to him about scheduling this that um, you know it was. This is a uh, a big desire to get uh, in front of um, as many people. You know, we can't. You know, something like this isn't isn't going to happen. Um, and you know, there had to be a first meeting. We wanted to live stream that, put it on Channel 22. This we unfortunately will not be able to live stream to Channel 22. We may or may not be able to live stream it. We can't. So come to the meeting. Um, and if you have questions before, I know that you know, we're we're ha like we can't respond to. I don't know. Maybe Councillor Bagley can to 200. <laughs> 
outdoor dining emails that all say, you know, not the same thing, but um, I have been trying to look through, you know, some of the questions that have kind of got overlooked in the deluge of outdoor dining emails. But if I haven't answered, if we haven't responded, please send that email again uh, before the 31st. Our goal is to have a conversation. It's not to, to say or dictate anything, it's to have a conversation. So uh, if you send an email and we haven't responded, we've gotten in uh, a lot of emails lately, so please just resend that um, and so that uh, we can try to answer that question before. Always reach out to us individually. I know, you know uh, Councilor Blaylock's having his uh, meetings um, and, and you know, there's not a place that he goes in the city without somebody asking about it, um, but uh, we want to hear from you. Councilor Bullock. Thank you, Governor. Um, and thank you for having this meeting. Um, I know my neighborhood's very excited to attend and have the opportunity to speak to the council, ask their questions, ask, I'm glad the PHA is going to be there. I think they have some questions for them as well. Um, but really, the neighborhood's excited, and they're excited to be part of this process. Um, just as far as getting the word out, I know I've asked the city manager if I could get flyers, because I'm going to go knock on doors. I think Councillor Denton's agreed to join me. Um, some of my neighbors are actually willing to join me too, just to help get the word out and make sure that everyone does know about this meeting. Um, I didn't know if it was possible. I remember when that was a voting ward. We used to have a DPW electric sign, just kind of saying, you know, sure. ward here. Mm -hmm. If we could do something like that, because then everyone that drives in will see it clear as day. And I think that would be helpful. We can get you some get flyers for tomorrow, and uh, we'll schedule the message board. Awesome. Thank you. That's a great idea. Thank you, Councilor Bella. Councilor Moreau. Will the meeting be able to be recorded so it can be then posted later for people to view that can't make it? We don't have production capability at that location. Our production capability is limited, so I think that's why we're stressing if you have concerns, please come in person or follow up before or after with questions via the City Council email. It's one of those old school, you know, Schools. what stays at Sherman, what happens at first, Sherman stays at Sherman. Sort of like going to El we like will Las take Vegas. minutes of the, 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 the meeting. Um, but uh, look forward to seeing everybody out there. Uh, I know we're really excited to, um, to have a collaborative conversation uh, around that. So that was it for me. Councillor Tabor, you're up. Thanks, Your Honor. I'm always excited to talk about community power. It's becoming a reality. Um, around the state, uh, the first wave of towns are just about to mail their notifications to residents to have the opportunity to switch over to lower cost and potentially greener power. Um, right near us, Hannah, uh, Exeter and Rye are slated to go and we'll start to see messaging from them. Um, here's some updates. First of all, a, a full an analysis of the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire shows that it will beat the Eversource default rate and even beat the rates of third-party brokers in many cases, like Standard Power. Um, but when Councillor Lazenby and I undertook Community Power back in 2021, our real motivation was to find a way to meet our residents' demand to buy more renewable energy and hasten our energy transition as a city. Um, so for that reason, we sent out um, a survey, which you probably got in your mailbox. Uh, we've had hundreds of responses, and it's to gauge what do you want to see in a community power? Do you want to see just the lowest rate? Uh, would you be willing to pay a little more for renewable energy? And so far, we're seeing healthy demand for people who want to uh, buy green power and help this city move away from fossil fuels. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the next steps, our energy, our, our energy committee is working on an aggregation plan required by statute, and uh, we have a draft of that. We're going to have two public hearings on February 2nd and February 9th and the public can uh, learn about the program, we'll have a presentation, and then they can give us more feedback. Uh, we'd initially thought that we would launch community power in Portsmouth in the fall. Um, that proves to be more risky than we first thought because of the historic kind of winter price spikes we're seeing uh, with volatility in the energy markets. And the coalition needs to build reserves um, so that we can have stable prices in these uh, crazy energy markets that we have. So we do have the opportunity to launch in June, and our community th uh, committee thought, let's do that rather than wait until next spring. 
we had a healthy discussion around that. Uh, we want to give our residents the benefit of the program. Our big concern was can we keep the community engaged and informed enough to move that fast? Um, <clears throat> and uh, our goal is to really, when we get to notifying customers that they have this opportunity, we don't want it to be a surprise. So to that end, and because we're going to bring our uh, energy aggregation plan to the council, we're hoping um, February 21st, we, I'd like to propose that we have a work session. Um, the other towns that we've talked to and cities like um, Lebanon find that it takes about an hour to, for a governing body to hear the presentation, ask all the questions, learn all the ins and outs uh, of electricity purchasing. And uh, February 6th, we've got a hearing on the CIP. That's not, we don't want to uh, try and tack something like that on to that meeting. So uh, we thought it best to have a, a work session. Um, <clears throat> so I would propose a motion to you that uh, we schedule a work session February 13th to present the Energy Advisory Committee's electric aggregation plan and plans to launch community power uh, in advance of a February 21st proposal to the Council to adopt the EAP. Second. Okay. And that's, that's my pitch. All right. Council Murrah has a question on the pitch. Uh, I'm just questioning, uh, uh, easy question, I hope. You keep saying it's going to be available to residents. It's going to be available to residents and businesses or just residents in residential properties? Residents and businesses. Most larger businesses already have some kind of brokered power. Yeah, but little businesses like me don't. That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly why we had the survey go to all businesses. It's sitting well on my as, desk. I'm going to do it. That's right. <laughs> it's on mine too. Councilor Cook, then Council Bullock. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I am, every time I go to an energy advisory committee <coughs> meeting, I'm always impressed by the level of knowledge and skill that the members of the committee bring to the city of Portsmouth. Um, we really are very fortunate that we have a lot of expertise there. And so I'm looking forward to having a work session so that um, the rest of you can hear all um, the information that has been shared with the energy advisory committee. Um, and can understand just the level of expertise that we have and that we're so fortunate to have in Portsmouth. Council Cook, Council Blaylock. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and thank you, Council Tabor, for bringing this forward. Um, I think this is, you know, any way to save people money on their electric bill and save businesses in town, and I think this is a good um, way to get there. I will warn, I uh, just asked the Chair, I will not be there, I will not be in town February 13th, um, but I trust that this Council will have a good work session and I will do my homework and catch up. Yes, Councilor Blaylock. Any other comments, questions? Well, I would uh, simply echo um, what has been said. Uh, Councilor Tabor, uh, <coughs> really excited about the work uh, that you've put into this. Councilor Lazenby and, and you uh, started, um, and you know, it's great where um, the market um, can help us make uh, better choices for our future uh, as well. Um, here and that's where I think um, we get some really cool things to happen. So look forward to the um, look forward to the presentation and uh, you know a, a slightly more uh, aggressive uh, timeline. Um, all for exploring whether or not that's something that we can uh, support, and hopefully we'll have enough questions answered by the time uh, June comes along to be able to to move forward uh, in the best interest of the city of Portsmouth. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, next up we're going Councillor Bagley, PTS. Thanks, Your Honor. Um, I move to approve and accept the action sheet and minutes of the January 5th, 2023 Parking and Traffic Safety Committee meeting. Second. Any discussion? I'll just highlight there is, um, one of the things we approved was a pilot for a mini roundabout um, on Bartlett Street and um, we're, we're expecting we might get some comments on that. Yeah, so 
uh, one of those comments would be, what are we, um, have we designed it, um, uh, are we doing something more than putting, uh, uh, you know, those orange the, barrels, orange barrels, uh, could we get something <laughs> where it's actually, you know, a little less, uh, I, I guess, ugly uh, without, you know, spending money? Is it something that we've put much thought into? We, we discussed that particular aspect. I don't think we can do it without spending money, but I do think there may be some funds available. Right, there's some funding available. I hear you on the rud overly rudimentary look and feel. It's gonna be a pilot, but the idea will be to mimic the area that, okay. uh, in the way it would be. So could we like, I guess, you know, it's like, you know, it's late enough, uh, nobody's here except on Zoom and uh, Channel 22, but whenever we say the word uh, Ballard, you know, I, I shiver uh, a little bit, but could we do something that is not going to like, you know, get dinged, you know, by uh, like a car or moved over, like that could be affixed in a more permanent uh, or uh, removable way? I guess I'll, I'll look to... I think we're going to have to let DPW okay. do Good. what they're going to do, and we're going to find out pretty quickly what the community thinks. We can take into consideration what you're saying. Because this is going to be so, like here's like you know for folks watching at home and, and some of my neighbors, this has always been a goal of eliminating truck traffic to make it harder to drive through this part uh, of town and make it slower to do so. I am going to get a thousand emails and they're all going to be directed by me because I'm two blocks away uh, from this. So um, I would love for there to be. Um, <coughs> You know, and this is you know something that could be extended in terms of these mini roundabouts. I know that they're popular in, in other parts of the world to be able to like. So it has to, we have to get some buy-in, you know, for it to, to people to see the change. Councilor Bagley, and, and I don't think uh, Director Peter Rice would mind me saying this, but there was a uh, community meeting uh, the week before the parking traffic and safety meeting, and they did propose two options, and the community um, that showed up to that meeting chose the roundabout option. Uh, I don't think it was Director Rice's first choice, but uh, there were two viable options, and, and the people at the meeting seemed to think that was the one okay. to go with. Well, you know, that's the uh, counselor. Uh, uh, I just have Lombardi. a question. Uh, yep. Thank you, Mayor. Um, how, how big is the center of this roundabout? It hasn't been, well, if it's been designed, it has not been shared with me. So we will yeah. um, provide regular updates at PTS along the way as we're planning this. Um, the geometry is such that it will support something in the center, and then the thing in the center will be something that public safety vehicles can mount. Okay. So just picture that, if you can, for now. That's what so we have. So it couldn't be a little uh, neighborhood green spot that um, it is has maintained? To be, it has by... to be mountable by a public safety yeah, vehicle. Yeah, okay. Interesting. And the semi's coming through. It's a Richie supply. <laughs> there, you know they're not allowed there unless they're making a delivery. Um, I've been, but I have photographic evidence of them uh, not doing that. Uh, that's been shared with me in the past. Okay. Any other uh, questions? Uh, I'm curious. What was the other option? It was kind of like a raised sidewalk intersection, like a table. Um, there were both good options. The the residents seemed to prefer the roundabout option, and and we decided to honor the will of the residents there. Sounds so good. on that, when it comes to, it would love you know to tie in some of the survey um, work. You know, eight thirty, and you know, I don't know, maybe the, the meeting was scheduled at a different time than that. But to be able to have a survey that we can trust is resident based, is easy to fill out, um, would be helpful. You know, there are definitely, in, you know, not casting any aspersions on the residents that showed up. I'm sure that they spoke for, you know, all the people that, that did show up. But typically, folks do not necessarily pay attention to something until they see a roundabout where there used to be four stop signs. Mm -hmm. And so I think we should be, you know, quick to have something that is, you know, that we will hear. We will try to get feedback in a uh, potentially a limited time frame to be able to uh, shape the discourse uh, going forward. Councilor Bagley? And, and I'll just add that the final point is the four stop signs don't really seem to be working. There's still a lot of truck traffic, and I don't want to uh, cast dispersions on anyone, but it seems a lot of people don't uh, necessarily think those stop signs apply to their particular vehicle. 
Hmm. So the solution that we have in place is not really working the way that we would like it to. Listen, or you could make everybody in Portsmouth the mayor, because uh, I stop at that stop sign every single time, just you know, for you know, in case somebody's going to look out. <laughs> but I would agree that, um, and you know, this is one of those things that I learned from from PTS. When you have two stop signs or four stop signs, two streets that come in with different traffic volumes, the one that doesn't have the high traffic volume. Uh, is you know always at risk of like the people in the high traffic volume just rolling through and they always roll through so this is an effort I would say that the neighborhood and you know this this specific micro neighborhood in general has been looking for a solution uh, to solving the fact that cars come through here at a high rate of speed they barely stop they take a left and so anything that can be done in order to slow that speed that rate of travel is something that uh, will be uh, uh, welcome. There might be some questions on this choice, but you know that's why it's a pilot, and we'll we'll figure it out. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. So we got through Councillor Cook and Councillor Bagley. Feels like a meeting ago. Um, next up, approval of grants and donations. I'd wait a sample motion to approve and accept the donation uh, uh, to the playground. Up, uh, for the playground update from the Portsmouth Rotary in the amount of $15,000 as presented. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, thank you again to the Portsmouth Rotary. Uh, the acceptance of a donation uh, uh, to the Portsmouth Tree Project from the Portsmouth Rotary in the amount of $15,000, I'd wait a sample motion to accept the donation as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, thank you again to the Portsmouth Rotary. Making there. note that the, the, the Trees and Greenery Committee is yeah. very excited. The, and, they're, and they're new council representative. On the there. portal is also open um, for any city residents that are looking to apply to get as part of the, four, the 400 trees for the 400th. Um, the city, you, you can apply to have, the, have one of these trees planted on your property. Um, and it's a program we do every year, but this year we have more trees. So that can be located on the city website if anyone is interested. And that is a, not a lot of people know about, well, hopefully more um, that are tuning in, but it's an amazing project. Uh, we want more trees. Sometimes we have to take trees down, and that's a, always a, you know, a, that's a disappointment, but uh, we have to think of ourselves as a 400-year-old city. Um, and uh, the project where they, uh, they get the tree established, they water it, um, it's a really awesome opportunity to bring shade um, and you know just a general quality of life and thank you assistant mayor for your work on that trees and greenery uh, committee i know that it's a passion of yours and, and thank you for making that passion uh supports and benefit mayor. Yes, i would also just remind people that the rotary also presented the city with a hundred thousand dollar check recently so they're being very generous to the city and i thank them Yep, uh, exactly. Thank you. They had that giant uh, check, and you know the work that they've done over the last uh, um, was it hundred? Was it their? It'll be the hundred, hundred years. their hundredth. You know, so they said three hundred years. Let's 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 uh, let's start this uh, now. Um, so uh, thank you for the partnership um, and all the work the Rotary does. Uh, next up, the acceptance of a donation to the skate park for Michelle uh, Dupras of uh, fifty dollars. I'd wait a sample motion to. Uh, approve and accept the donation as presented. So moved. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Your Honor, I can give a brief update on McIntyre if you like. Um, since the supplemental appropriation was approved back on January 9th, the city is currently under contract with two expert financial firms. One is in charge of examining the developer's construction cost estimates that were presented to us. And the second will examine the various ways in which this project can be financed to identify the best possible financial arrangement for the city. The first of three check-ins during this 90-day period is set for next Tuesday, January 31st. And um, as part of this entire approval process, the city has signed and executed with the General Services Administration a license agreement extension. And one of the requirements of that license agreement extension was to submit a series of milestones that um, are that will serve to track our progress through the 90 days and the GSA has to approve uh, where we stand within those milestones in order to keep moving through the process and we will bring further updates to the council as we have them thank you Did you want to say that? oh right uh, thank you um, 
<coughs> City, Attorney, City Attorney Morrill reminds me that the license agreement extension and those milestones are currently at the top of the McIntyre page, which can be found on the city's website if you tab down under residents. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager. Uh, anything on the report back on disc golf? I, I was just going to make a motion to go past 1030, although we're so We're close. two minutes away from <clears throat> doing that. Uh, anything on disc golf, uh, Councillor Cook? Not on disc golf, no. I, okay. I mean, as a city manager. Anything uh, other than the, yeah. the report back is in the... Uh, no, no, I, I could reiterate that, but nothing new that, right. that isn't in Todd's memo. Okay. Uh, miscellaneous? Just, I, I did um, at a previous meeting ask for a report back on the Bellamy uh, water line going to the private property. Yes. I just wonder. We will bring that forward. That will be February 6th. <clears throat> Councilor Cook. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was hoping now that the city manager is also sitting on the PDA board with uh, Councilor Lombardi that we could get a report back on the proposed refueling facility at the, the Port mm -hmm. at Peace. Yep. Um, I won't formally sit at a board meeting until March because they don't meet in February. I know that um, it was extended at their TRC or um, technical review committee to the February meeting. And beyond that, I'll bring updates as, as they are available. I could just um, report a little bit on that, that the um, uh, millionaire company, air company, is, um, is a FBO a um, fixed base operator uh, who wants to come into Pease and um, which in general is a good thing but he want they want to put a um, a, a fuel farm uh, close to the wetlands at Pease and so there's uh, a good deal of uh, resident uh, from basically from mostly from Newington um, concern about that but from other places too uh, and I think the city should be looking at that as well because we have wells out there and so it could affect our aquifer. Thank you Councilman Barty. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, I would just like to update the um, <coughs> residents on trash pickup today. Uh, tonight is moved to tomorrow night and this morning is moved to Saturday. Um, with that, uh, I will wait a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, Portsmouth.